Hey guys, Tim Ferriss here. Before we jump into this episode, I'm going to do something I very rarely do, and that is to make a direct ask with hat in hand. My brand new book just came out today. It is called Tribe of Mentors, subtitle Short Life Advice from the Best in the World. If you like the podcast, you will love this book. I reached out to 130 people who are the best at what they do in sports, investing, business, acting, directing, you name it, we got it. Cryptocurrency, done. And it turned out better than I ever could have expected. Many of my friends think of all my books, it is the easiest to read, the easiest to use. So check it out. Please take a look. I put out so much free material. The podcast is free. The 700 plus blog posts are free. Every once in a while, I put out something like this, and it's not that expensive. So please take a look, tribeofmentors.com, and it does make a great holiday gift or gift for others. There's something for everybody in here. It is really a choose-your-own-adventure guide, a buffet of options for improving your life, both in business and in the personal sphere. So take a look. I appreciate you taking a look, tribeofmentors.com or anywhere the books are sold. Optimal minimal. At this altitude, I can run flat out for a half mile before my hands start shaking. Can I answer your personal question? Now it is seen in a perfect time. What if I did the opposite? I'm a cybernetic organism, living tissue over a metal endoskeleton. This episode is brought to you by Peloton, and I'd heard about Peloton over and over again, but I ended up getting a Peloton bike and the whole system after I saw my buddy, Kevin Rose. I've known him forever, some of you know, and he showed up at my gate at my house a while back, and he looked fantastic. And uh, I asked him, I said, dude, you look great. What the hell have you been up to? Because he's always doing a weird diet or another, but it only lasts like a week or two. So he always regresses to the mean after like 75 beers. And he said, I've been doing Peloton five days a week. Now that caught my attention because Kevin does nothing five days a week. And you know, I love you, Kevin, but it really piqued my curiosity, ended up getting a system and it's become an integral part of my week. I love it. And I really didn't expect to love it at all because I find cycling really boring usually, but Peloton is an indoor cycling bike that brings live studio classes right into your home. You don't have to worry about fitting classes into your schedule or making it to a studio with some type of commute, etc. New classes are added every day, and this includes options led by elite New York City instructors in your own living room. You can even live stream studio classes taught by the world's best instructors or find your own favorite class on demand. And in fact, Kevin and I rarely do live classes, and you can compete with your friends, which is also fun. Kevin, I'm coming after you, but we usually just use classes on demand. I really like Matt Wilpers and his high intensity training sessions that are shorter, like 20 minutes. And I think Kevin's favorite is Alex and everyone seems to have their favorite instructor or you can select by music duration and so on. Each Peloton bike includes a 22 inch HD touchscreen performance tracking metrics. I think that along with the real time leaderboard are the main reasons that this caught my attention when cycling never had caught my attention before. It's really pretty stunning what they've done with the user interface to keep your attention. The belt drive is quiet and it's smaller than you would expect. So it can fit in a living room or an office. I actually have it in a large closet, believe it or not, and it fits with no problem. So Peloton is offering all of you guys, listeners of the Tim Ferriss Show, a special offer, and it is actually special. Visit One Peloton, that's O N E P E L O T O N, OnePeloton.com, and enter the code TIM, all caps T I M, at checkout to receive $100 off accessories with your Peloton bike purchase. Now you might say, meh, accessories? Wait, I don't need fancy towels or whatever other supplemental bits and pieces. No, the shoes you need. You need the clip-in shoes, and those are in the accessory category. So this $100 off is a very legit $100 off. So if you want to get in your workouts, if you want a convenient and really entertaining way to do high-intensity interval training or anything else, or you just want to get a fantastic gift for someone, check out Peloton. OnePeloton.com and enter the code TIM. Again, that's O-N-E-P-E-L. 
O T O N dot com and enter the code Tim at checkout to receive one hundred dollars off any accessories, including the shoes that you will want to get. Check it out. OnePeloton dot com code Tim. This episode is brought to you by Four Sigmatic, founded by the genius Finns who lit the internet on fire. And uh, you may have heard of their mushroom coffee, which features chaga and lion's mane, which has taken Silicon Valley by storm. I use it pretty much every day, either that or the chaga, which is decaf, there's a separate version. And I use both of these primarily for focus and productivity. They just get you going, light you up like a Christmas tree. So you should definitely check it out. People are always asking me what I use for cognitive enhancement. And for right now, this is the answer. I try to force this on all of my house guests. It is a hell of a thing. If I have employees or people come over who are working on projects with me, I always try to feed it to them because I'm going to get the limitless effect and get a lot more out of them. The first time I mentioned this product and Four Sigmatic on the podcast, their products sold out in less than a week. So you may want to check them out soon if you're listening to this. And the coffee tastes like coffee. It uh, takes just seconds to prepare with hot water. And oddly enough, only includes 40 milligrams of caffeine. So it has less than half of what you'd get in a regular cup of coffee. I don't get any jitters, acid reflux, or any stomach burn, any of that. It's very unusual and very, very cool. So If you don't want caffeine, they also offer very strong but caffeine-free mushroom elixirs, which I will sometimes have in the evening. I find chaga specifically to be very, very grounding and earthy. So that is another option. And I have a cupboard full of their products uh, at the moment, which is right around the corner of my kitchen. You can try something. You can try a sample pack, which is great also, right now by going to Four Sigmatic dot com forward slash Tim. That's Four Sigmatic, F-O-U-R-S-I-G-M-A-T-I-C dot com forward slash Tim and use the code Tim, T-I-M to get 20% off of your first order. And they're not that expensive anyway. If you are in the experimental mindset, I do not think you'll be disappointed. So try them out. Hello, boys and girls, ladies and germs, you sexy little kittens. This is Tim Ferriss and welcome to another episode of the Tim Ferriss Show, where it is my job to interview and deconstruct world-class performers of all different types to tease out the habits and routines, tactics, thinking, philosophies, belief structures that you can use. And this episode, kids, if you're in the car listening to this with your parents, earmuffs, holy shit, what a treat. I (laughs) am so happy, could not be happier with what you're about to listen to. And it's all because of the guest. And uh, by way of background, when I was in Uzbekistan with, with Kevin Kelly, and if you haven't heard of Kevin Kelly, you can check out my interviews with him. I have argued for a very long time that Kevin may in fact be the real world, most interesting man in the world. But when I asked him, when we were, when we were in the back of a taxi in Uzbekistan, long story, who I should have on the podcast, he gave me a very, very complete list. But the first two names were... Tim O'Reilly and Stuart Brand. And when I've asked Kevin who his mentors are, who he considers mentors, the first name that he brings up is Stuart Brand. So who is Stuart? (laughs) Stuart is one of the sharpest, most badass guys you'll ever meet. And it's kind of like Forrest Gump. He shows up at every possible historical moment you can conceive of. Stuart Brand at Stuart Brand, is the president of the Long Now Foundation, established to creatively foster long-term thinking and responsibility in the framework of the next 10,000 years. Yes, that's not a typo. He leads a project there called Revive and Restore, which seeks to bring back extinct animal species such as the passenger pigeon and woolly mammoth. Stuart is very well known for founding, editing, and publishing the Whole Earth Catalog, which changed my life when I was a little kid, and we talk about it. And it also received a National Book Award for its 1972 issue. And on top of that, and we delve into this, Steve Jobs talks about it in his most famous commencement speech. Stuart is the co-founder of The Well and Global Business Network and the author of books including Whole Earth Discipline, The Clock of the Long Now, How Buildings Learn, and The Media Lab. He was trained in biology at Stanford and served as an infantry officer in the U.S. Army. Stuart can cover so many different spheres of expertise and speak intelligently on very, very high concepts ranging from evolution to the nitty-gritty of designing, say, finite, or I should say rather 
infinite versus finite games for different groups of people. It's just so much fun to speak with Stuart, and I've been hoping to do this interview for a very, very, very long time. It came together, and maybe the caffeine level on my side was right. I think Stuart's always on point, but I'm just thrilled with how it all turned out. So we'll link to everything in the show notes, of course, as usual, that you can find at tim.blog forward slash podcast, and there will be a lot of links. But I really hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. So without further ado, please meet the one and only and incredible Stuart Brand. Stuart, welcome to the show. Howdy, Tim. (laughs) Howdy. I have been wanting to interview you for a very, very long time indeed. And our mutual friend, Kevin Kelly, who's, I used to say, was the real life uh, most interesting man in the world, but I think you may actually give him a run for the money. And it's, it's I, I suppose, appropriate that I'm recording this from where I am on Long Island, where I grew up, because at my parents' house, which is, is right next to me, in the shed, I rem- remember as a child going in to find a single copy of the Whole Earth Catalog. And I would go to the Whole Earth Catalog, I remember exactly where it is in the shed, and I would sit down for hours flipping around in this incredible tome. And uh, I wanted to thank you for that, first and foremost, because it had a a real formative impact on me in my childhood years. Well, that's amazing. I I hear that a lot. I'm curious, do you remember any of what particularly got you going through the catalog back then. Yeah, there were a, well there were a few things and maybe you can I've actually never told anybody this. So the the first was uh I want to say that there were geodesic domes uh or or some sort of graphic representations of geodesic domes which at the time oh. uh were just very fascinating to me and I my my grandfather was a classical sculptor on one side and so it was very interested in shapes. I wanted to be an illustrator and a comic book penciler for about 15 years. So anything that represented an unusual, what I felt was an unusual shape in the physical world was very interesting to me. Uh, And then uh, this could be a false memory. So please correct me if I'm wrong, but as a, I don't know how old I was, nine or 10 year old, maybe even younger, was there any uh, not nudity necessarily, but were there any ah. breasts of any type in the whole Earth catalog? Because if so, uh, that was probably also a big draw for me. Yeah, there were breasts. There was even a crotch, I think, in the uh, <laughs> uh, My Body, Myself, which was this wonderful <laughs> book that came out on uh, women's health by women. Um, and uh, it was uh, just the facts, ma'am, and... Uh, <laughs> Graphic and, and rich. It was a, uh, I think it was a collective in Boston of women who put it together, and it was kind of a revolution of users just taking hold of medicine and revamping how it was thought about. And uh, women were then and probably now, especially in need of uh, better facts than they were getting from the male medical establishment. So, so the the answer I gave you, I feel like, might be very trivial. Uh, are there? Do you do you have any common answers that pop up often when you ask people that question about what stuck with them or what really grabbed their attention? I suppose it probably depends on their the age at which they came across it. But are, are there certain things that really stick out often yeah. for people? Well, uh, the common thing is, uh, wow, you did the whole Earth catalog. It really affected my life. You know, I I still have. Uh, the original Whole Earth Catalog, and then I'll check and see if they mean the very first one that came out in 1968. There were only a thousand printed, and know what they mean is their for, first Whole Earth Catalog, which was probably the last Whole Earth Catalog in 1972, so called. Um, and then I'll ask them, um, "Why do you still have it?" And there's this wonderful silence, um, and I've never gotten a good answer. Uh, I think it has something to do with a sense of a certain era um, or a certain period in the life of that person kind of coming of age and coming into who they were and who they wanted to be. And the catalog, I guess they felt, was some kind of 
enabler or uh, tipping point from uh, one way of thinking about what they could do to another way of thinking about it. So anyway, a lot of people who kept them. There's no end of basements and attics that have holder catalogs in them. <laughs> now, one, one, one fan who comes to mind, and I'm sure there are many who have name recognition, but is Steve Jobs. So he... I mean, he's, he referred to you in his Stanford commencement speech, uh, which, of course, has become very, very popular. And uh, he refers to the amazing publication called The Whole Earth Catalog, one of the Bibles of my generation. Uh, have, have you spent any time or did you spend any time with Steve and get an idea of why, why it had such an impact on him? Uh, I did spend time with Steve a few times. Um, and we did, in fact, even find... Um, YouTube, some videos we did together for uh, the Library of Congress. We were both, the uh, Library of Congress asked both of us to help promote a new program they were doing. We were both glad to do it. And so we sat down together and did some fun stuff. That was also when Steve put out his uh, personal computers or bicycle of the mind um, that you know, vastly enable and everything. The question I never got to ask Steve was um, at the end of that commencement speech, what he put out to the Stanford students was uh, what had been on the back cover of the Whole Earth Epilogue, which came out in 73, 74, uh, and it said, stay hungry, stay foolish. And for some reason, that really got Steve. And uh, his commencement talk was wonderful because it was basically about, um, well, he gives three stories, but the main story is that he's been scared to death by his pancreatic cancer diagnosis and um, lived, at least for a good and important while. And so from that perspective, he was kind of just giving the, the students a little bit of a signal from the other side of a temporary grave. And uh, that, that's part of what made it such an amazing talk. Um, and his final line, basically, to students was, stay hungry, stay foolish. And the question I never had a chance to ask Steve, even though I did see him for lunch after that talk, um, was what got him about that. And um, various people, including me, have tried to interpret why he in particular was moved by stay hungry, stay foolish. But I think he was putting it out from a position of, at that point, a whole hell of a lot of power and by then also wealth. And he was into issues like the innovator's dilemma of how do you keep your business from uh, clinging to its past so much that it becomes part of the past? And how do you keep revolutionizing your own process, your own thinking, your own business, your own whatever? And I think he was using, I'm surmising, maybe he was using stay hungry, stay foolish as a sort of a uh, refreshment exercise. What was intended by stay foolish, stay hungry, I feel like I can interpret in a number of ways that I would probably have some consensus on with other people. What what about the stay foolish? What was intended by that? Or could you elaborate um, on that? The back cover of the whole epilogue was a photograph I commissioned uh, that was meant to look like sunrise of uh, that a hitchhiker might see on some roadside. And it was in relation to a photograph of the Earth uh, at the moment of the sun just coming around, um, just making a crescent of, uh, so the, the, the limb of the Earth basically is just a crescent of light from the sun. So, you know, that's sunrise happening somewhere on Earth. And so I wanted to get that from the surface. But the, the dawn, someone's eyes must meet the dawn uh, the Dawn Hitchhiker is headed wherever the next driver is headed, in a way. And uh, that's a foolish way to get through life. But it's also a randomizing way to get to wherever you're going. Um, I think I was promoting the idea of occasionally staying random. Mm -hmm. um, Nikki Case uh, just recently gave one of our Long Now talks where he points out that chaos is an important part of uh, keeping creativity and evolution and everything else going. 
the story in evolution is what they call fitness landscapes, and it's a biologist from the 50s. Um, I'm really won over by them. The idea of a fitness landscape is it's a series of uh, hills and mountains. And typically when a species is evolving, it'll <clears throat> evolve to a local optimum. The local optimum might be just the hill that happened to be nearby. It gets better and better and better going up that hill and it gets to the peak and then it stays there. But all around it may well be uh, much higher peaks of much greater opportunity, much greater fitness, whatever it may be. Uh, but as long as it's focusing on being really, really good and being on top of the hill it's on, uh, it will never get to those mountains. The only way it'll get to those mountains is by being foolish, uh, by trying weird stuff, by being random, by um, uh, recombinating or uh, mutating sort of down off the hill a little bit, maybe even down into the nearby valley, which looks horrible. Uh, and then trying new things uh, that improve on the new slope they're on, which could well be a higher mountain. So it gets you off the, the, the low hill of fitness to potentially a high mountain of fitness is randomness. Uh, that's stay foolish. Has that been a conscious decision on your part throughout your life to insert a randomizing <laughs> function or has it really just been serendipity no i'm just wondering i mean you've lived so many lives uh, yeah, I was, i've been very fair. intimidated by the interview because i'm like how the hell i don't where where's where should i start where's the beginning where's the end it's very challenging so i'm just curious how you th if that's something you've thought about as you've made decisions in your own life as, as near as i can tell tim the um my version of randomness is pretty low threshold of boredom <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, can you elaborate? Uh, because, you know, the way that works is, you know, like with various sports, when they came along, skydiving came along. No, that doesn't count because I stopped doing that because I had a parachute not open. Um, but uh, hang gliding came along and uh, or snowboarding. Those were two sports. That, as soon as they showed up, I, I got into it. And pretty quickly... I just ran out of uh, excitement <laughs> uh, up the hill, down the hill, up the hill, down the hill in both cases. Um, and I bailed. I, I have bailed out of a lot of interesting things. It uh, is a not good career advice in terms of uh, scoring big because as Brian Eno is pointed out to me and to others, the way to make a lot of money is to have a very good idea and then be extremely careful never to have another. <laughs> I haven't heard that before. Oh, man, it, that's it, you know, It's true for artists. It's true in business. It's true in all sorts of things. That, you, know, you sort of develop an expertise. You get rewarded for it. And uh, if it really looks like it is one of those mount opportunities... Uh, the temptation is just keep storming up the mountain. Um, what kind of after sorry. after a while, you can sort of see what the limits are, or you find yourself doing the same mental and physical things day after day after day after day. And meanwhile, other stuff is kind of tempting, um, or they just show up. A lot of my stuff it just showed up, Tim. I. I dealing with a biographer now, and he's raising some of these same questions. And um, when I thought about doing a memoir, I thought about uh, using a title from Arthur Kessler about astronomers called the Sleepwalkers. And those things that I progressed from one to another, uh, they were not part of any arc of ambition or even a narrative arc. They were just sort of what seemed like a good idea at the time, uh, based on what was around me. So I think biographies, including mine, consist mostly of circumstance and sequence, and then you map onto that character, and, and uh, any stories or something you tell backwards. All right, so I, I want to dissect the, the stories or things that you tell backwards in a second, but first, there's something you mentioned in passing that I feel like I have to address as a sort of a pink elephant in the room that my listeners are going to ask me about if I don't ask you, which is 
you mentioned I did skydiving for a while, but then I had a parachute not open. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry. You... That's an easy story. <laughs> okay. um, I took airborne training when I was an Army officer. And uh, when I was stationed at Fort Dix, skydiving was just starting to come along as a thing that you could do. The U.S. Army had a skydiving team and things like that. And so this is in 61, 62, we were in New Jersey, and um, uh, just a couple of the local guys got together and we started, uh, we would take uh, military chutes and and cut gores in the side and then a section out of the back and then put sort of pegged strings up to where the gores were. And by pulling on the strings, you could sort of steer and it would sort of go forward. And then uh, we'd ride a plane and, and jump out and do, I don't know, uh, you know, first jump and pull and then five-second delays and so on. And it was great fun. And, and by then, teaching basic training at Fort Dix was uh, boring for, for all of the officers who'd been in for a year and a half at that point. So then when I got out of the Army in 62, um, there was a, by then a pretty good amateur skydiving scene going on in Northern California, so I joined that and was jumping on the weekends up near uh, Mount Calistoga in northern Napa Valley. And um, it was a young and dangerous sport at that time. It was still a, a parachute, an Army parachute that I'd taken from the Army and that I had adapted, or I guess I'd had uh, guys who were doing adaptations do it. And one of the times I jumped out, and um, I think I was doing a 10-second delay, and you're sort of counting 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000. And I got to my count and um, pulled the parachute. Uh, you reach across yourself and pull the ripcord, and then the parachute comes out, and there's a kind of sudden stop, and then you have just a really pleasant, long uh minute or so glide down to where you're going to try to land on a target and um, this idol was interrupted by the fact that the parachute was not opening <laughs> <laughs> and there was I could sense there was crap going on behind me and the great thing about parachute training in the army is that you go through a lot of uh, stuff of what do you do if the parachute doesn't open there's a reserve chute a little uh, stuffed together laundry thing on the front of your, your main chute's on the back, and there's this little chute in the front. And um, one of the things you're told is if you have to open the reserve, you know, um, go for it, and then turn sideways in the air, because if you're facing straight down in the standard uh, position that you skydive in, the chute will open around you, and besides being dead on arrival, you'll already be in a shroud. So uh, I had this wonderful moment of, oh, <laughs> Uh, suddenly the spotlight is on me. I could see San Francisco in the distance. I happened to be facing that direction and sort of had those cosmic thoughts. And I also had at that point eight seconds to live. Um, so before I'd be a greasy spot. And what I found myself doing was what I was trained to do. And this is one of the things that persuaded me that training is better than almost any other form of instruction. Uh, which is I rotated 90 degrees in the air, reached for the reserve chute, pulled it, it popped out with a terrible jerk, and uh, then I had the somewhat faster cruise down to the ground without any ability to control it, which was alarming because the wind was taking me towards some power lines. No oh, God. Anyway, I landed, and that was that. Um, and But it was late in the day, so I didn't go back up, or maybe I was afraid to go back up, when I did go back up the following weekend, I did a, uh, a very dangerous jump. I almost hit my head on the step, leaving the small plane. I never really stabilized in free fall. And basically, it was, a, it was a screwed up jump. And that persuaded me that my body was not happy doing parachuting anymore. So I stopped. <laughs> I don't, okay, I'm, I think that's a very reasonable conclusion. Oh, by the way, what caused the malfunction was um, uh, the pilot chute that jumps out of your backpack first and then pulls out the sleeve, which then uh, reveals the parachute. That's how it opens in a, in a less than totally sudden way. Uh, that pilot chute jumped out, and the tether that it was on 
uh, managed to tie an overhand knot in the bottom of the sleeve. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> so even if I'd spent my eight seconds trying to undo the, the tangle, uh, <laughs> I would have still been tugging at the knot when I hit the ground. <laughs> <laughs> was, there, was there any other training uh, or principles that you took from the mili- your military experience that ended up being helpful later? Well, there's a lot of instruction. Um, I was I take I was lucky. I took ROTC at Stanford and then did two years active duty as soon as I graduated, and then uh, often went to Fort Benning to uh, officer's basic training course. And there I got all you know most of the basics of small unit management and leadership that uh, my generation. Um, of liberal types mostly did not get. So, you know, me and John Kerry and a few others. Uh, and it was, you know, just simple things like, um, okay, uh, you're responsible for the people in your command. You're going to critique them to get them doing ever better, especially the sergeants that work for you. And the way you begin a tr- critique is by um, telling the, the sergeant, what uh, he or now she has been doing very well, and thank you for that. And it's got to be close, and it's got to be accurate and well observed. And then you can say, but on the other hand, there's I think one thing you could be working on, and probably not more than one thing, or you overwhelm them, and you give them something to work on for improvement, and let them know you're going to be watching to see science of that improvement, which you will, you know, congratulate them for when it shows up, and then come up with some other. Uh, item of potential improvement. Just that sequence of telling them what they're doing right before telling them what they're doing wrong. That's just the kind of thing that you know good management instruction does. And uh, you know, it's done at taxpayer expense. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, I want to talk about uh, the Holers catalog a little bit more, and. And I know that you've, you've probably told many stories about the Whole Earth Catalog, but for those people who are listening who don't have context, I want to read just a, a short quote, which is from a, uh, a piece from The Guardian, so that they have a little bit of context. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to borrow from a couple of different pieces, but the Whole Earth Catalog has been called the Internet Before the Internet. And then quoting from this piece... It wasn't exactly a book. It was a how-to manual, a compendium, an encyclopedia, a literary review, an an opinionated life guide, and a collection of readers' recommendations and reviews of everything from computational physics to goat husbandry. (laughs) And it seemed, even as a kid reading this book, that it was the type of project that would take a lot out of a person. Uh, So rather than than go into the creation of it necessarily, although we could, I, we could certainly get into it. Uh, I, I had not been, a, not been aware that, at least based on some of the reading I did, when you shut down the whole Earth catalog, what followed was a pretty severe depression. And you and I saw each other not too long ago at TED, where I uh-huh. spoke for the first time on the main stage and decided two weeks beforehand that I would completely redo my presentation and talk about uh, severe depression and how close I came to suicide at one point in college. Uh Would you mind sharing with people a little bit of that period in your life and what you found helpful to regain your footing? Well, I saw that TED Talk, Tim, and what I liked about it especially, and a lot of people like it, it's doing very well online, uh, was the the fear naming uh, aspect of that. You sort of catalog the things you're actually worried about uh, and then work through on each one, uh, you know, what happens if it actually happens, what do you deal with that, how can you head it off, and, and sort of take it apart in detail uh, rather than just go along with this sort of blank uh, I'm too afraid to make this move approach to things. I really like that. And it's something I think we're going to uh, find a way to use for some of the people who get worried about uh, uh, the use of genetics in conservation, which is what I do most. Oh, fantastic. Mm-hmm. But 
Um, back then, I think I stopped the catalog partly because I thought it was a good idea to uh, stop something at, at its sort of peak of success uh, just to see what would happen. It was kind of a you know, feline curiosity. Um, but it wasn't that then I became depressed. I also was eager to shut it down by uh, 1971 because I was depressed. And it was a combination of a marriage, probably, that was going sour. Uh, great it is it had been for a few years. And um, various things that often go on with first-time success. Uh, I didn't know how to, as yet, uh, sort of modulate my work and schedule, and so I was living at the office most of that time. How, how old were you at the time, just to place us? Um, so, you know, it was uh, basically 30, 31, 32, mm -hmm. right in there. Got it. And uh, by now, people who at that age have been through three or four uh, failures and successes and whatnot. In those days, it was still my first. And I was considered young at the time to be having a sort of national scale publication of great interest to a lot of people. Um, there was not money issues. It was a nonprofit, so I was just getting a, a nonprofit salary of 10000 a year or something like that. Um, the fame part, I think, was not particularly problematic. I mean... As you know, any kind of fame can lead you into a kind of a self-caricature uh, sequence where you, you wind up um, being driven around by your image rather than vice versa. But that was not really an issue either. I think it was uh, vacationless overwork and uh, tough marriage and took a couple of years to get out of it. And due course it did. Years later, I had another one. Uh, they come, they go. I am now a great fan of uh, drugs like Zoloft that can take, in my case, um, depression had an occasional panic type attack, and uh, Zoloft is fabulous against panic attacks. So you found that the panic preceded the depression? It was sort of a triggering event or a triggering Yeah, it was phase? a... It was a um, I think one of the elements, I don't know, you know, who knows what triggers what. Sure. Um, actually, there was a, a recent trigger in the sense that um, I had a vertigo experience in the in the middle of the night when I just turned over to the right and suddenly the bedroom was spinning and uh, my wife Ryan is uh, trying to settle me down and we go off to the emergency room and the guy uh, there says, oh yeah, it's vertigo, pretty common. But uh, and you know, there's a, a maneuver that you can turn your head in a certain way and then you get the thing that's causing the vertigo, vertigo that's in your middle ear to go to the right place so it doesn't do that anymore. It's a fabulous correction. But at that particular time, it was the first time my um, brain or my brain body had sort of uh, frightened me like that. And so I was fearful for a year or two after that. Uh, and part of that would be kind of panicking at the kind of things that people panic at. Uh, standing around for a long time in public or driving on a bridge, things like that. And Zoloft is great. It just cuts the peak right off of any kind of panic. And then you realize it's you're not, you don't get scared about panicking. <laughs> right. You don't so start that, panicking you know, about the panic. You got it. And, and then uh, just by taking the peak of fearfulness away, then the whole thing gets under control. So now that we're on the subject of, broadly speaking, pharmacology, I had read uh, that, uh, well, I'd, I'd, I'd heard someone refer to you, actually, it was a hearing, not reading, refer to you as a pioneer, early pioneer in psychedelics, but that you had stopped, but that you had stopped. And I'm curious to know why that, uh, why that is, and if you could give us any any backstory on that well i happened to be in the bay area when um lsd was first being researched by then uh, at that point still legally as a uh sort of a psychological fitness <laughs> um a 
way to do psychotherapy, a way to do uh, severely enhanced psychotherapy, which, by the way, has come around again now. It's kind of fun to see. And I think a lot of it applied. So, you know, using MDMA on uh, uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome and things like that, which our friend Rockefeller, Richard Rockefeller was pushing strongly uh, uh, until just before he died. Uh, that's good stuff. But so then the, these drugs were around um, a lot. I never actually bought a psychedelic drug. People would, there was so much of it in the 60s at this point that uh, you know, just the marijuana and hashish that people gave me, the LSD that people gave me, the masculine that people gave me, um, or the sessions going on that I would join in. And then I, I joined the Native American Church formally and was I went to for a number of peyote meetings and then round, wound up leading one or two as a road man. Um, and it sounds like I was doing all the drugs in the world, but you know, compared to my contemporaries, <laughs> I was pretty <laughs> modest. And uh, I did see a few people who thought that the problem that might be caused by uh, bad trips from LSD was to do more LSD. And I was pretty sure that that was <laughs> not the direction to look for a solution. Um, so one day I had some bad trips and some good trips. And wound up the last one was in 1969, the occasion of Ken Kesey and the Merry Pranksters and their bus uh, in New Mexico having a race with the hog farm bus and the great uh, bus race. Uh, I dosed up on a certain amount of LSD and that was a fun and amazing experience, and also the last time I did LSD. After that, I, then I continued to do nitrous oxide for a while. Nitrous having the advantage of being completely legal. I had an, like an E-tank delivered weekly at my office. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and nitrous, you, know, you do uh, a flash, and if you like the flash, you can do another. Um, and if you don't like the flash, then you stop. So it's a little more self-correcting in that respect. But uh, one day I just kept flashing. I think I was listening to the Beatles, uh, probably, probably Sergeant Pepper. And um, and the world went away. And then I was on the whole other side of uh, a large room. And my wife was shaking me, saying, you're laughing hysterically. <laughs> uh, it is laughing gas, after all. But uh, clearly I had... Uh, gone over some edge with nitrous oxide, so I stopped doing that. <laughs> Why did you stop doing? Was the LSD then a, a matter of the cessation, a matter of legality at that point? Oh God, no. Um, well, I, I could be, but I, you know, everything was illegal. So um, I, I, you know, Ken Kesey did this event we he called the acid test graduation and partly it was finessing his legal problems but also it was an acknowledgement that um you know you go through the doors of perception that all this huxley talks about and uh, you're in this cosmic place and then the trip is over and you're back and you go back through and there's the cosmic place and you go back through and you go back and there's the cosmic place and there's uh, terrifying versions and exalted versions, but in a sense, it's the same cosmic place. Uh, so two things happened. One, I got sort of uh, recognized that there wasn't a lot of news anymore. And uh, a sort of side effect was I became much more suspicious about mysticism in general, which I studied in college, both Christian mysticism and everybody else's mysticism. And had a feeling like um, I'd, I'd taken the shortcut into that world, and uh, there wasn't as much there as I uh, had thought and hoped. So I might I might come back to that for people who don't know the name Ken Kesey. He's the author of of other things. One flew over the cuckoo's nest, and then the uh, the pranksters. <laughs> and the the rip roaring ride uh, that you mentioned also led you to appear just as a, a point of trivia. Please correct me if I'm wrong. In Tom Wolfe's The Electric Kool Aid Acid Test, 
Uh-huh. Uh, so just as a, as a side note, because you, you make these appearances in so many sort of defining cultural works or moments it's almost like watching Forrest Gump, but with someone who's mm. not Forrest Gump. I mean, it's really astonishing. Well, I'm on the box of chocolates. You know, you really do not know what you're going to get <laughs> uh, approach to things. But yeah, I, I got lucky. But partly uh, by choice, I'm in a creative area where uh, you know, it specializes in doing weird stuff in the San Francisco Bay Area. And... Um, you run into a lot and wind up connecting with a lot that turns out to be important just by sort of strolling around. Can you tell us about the about Blue Marble? Uh, so the can you tell us about the buttons uh, that you distributed, uh, or I guess you were selling them uh, way back in the day, and give us a little bit of context. On. Okay, the blue marble you're referring to is the, the look of the Earth from space. Yeah, and we're still talking about drugs because uh, I uh, was bored in the spring of 1966, and on my rooftop in North Beach, San Francisco, I took sort of a half a dose, maybe 100, 150 micro, micrograms, of micro whatever. Of, yeah, micrograms. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, of LSD, um, and. Uh, just had a nice, long, thoughtful afternoon that was colored by having listened to a fair amount of Buckminster Fuller lectures and read his books over the previous months, where he had said that um, people assume that the resources of the Earth are infinite, and in their mind, the Earth is flat. And if they would just understand that the Earth is really a sphere with a limited amount of surface and resources and everything else, then they would behave better. And then they're stoned looking out at the San Francisco skyline and um, imagine to myself that I can see that the buildings are all vertical, but they're not exactly parallel. They diverge slightly because of the curvature of the Earth and sort of the fish-eyed thing happening in my mind. And then I imagine, well, if I went up a little ways, I would see that even more strongly. I went up further still in altitude. I would, you know, the horizon would close on itself and be an obvious circle. And then I guess I took my mind further out. This is kind of a star maker story. Uh, Olaf Stapleton's story begins this way. Um, And then in my mind, I I saw the Earth not only as a circle, but as a sphere um, rotating uh, against a star field. I thought, now that's, that is really the way to see the Earth. But it's weird that we haven't seen that because this is 1966. Sputnik went up in 1956. So uh, the Soviet Union and America had been in space for, at that point, 10 years. And there were no end of photographs of the moon and the beginnings of satellite photography of various parts of the Earth's surface. But... Nobody had ever turned the camera back on the Earth from one of these remote probes to see what the Earth looked like from a distance. And so the kind of LSD concentration, which is, and we call it a psychedelic, meaning mind expanding, but I think it's actually a mind contracting drug, where you, you really focus on your hand or the song that's playing or whatever it is, the fire. Um, I was really focused on, uh, gee, what do I do to make people aware of the importance of the image of the Earth from space? And what I came up with was this concept of a button that you mentioned that would say, um, uh, why haven't we seen a photograph of the whole Earth yet? It was sort of put in uh, paranoid terms so that uh, it's a question. (laughs) <laughs> so that people would you know, raise the question I had, how come we've been in space for 10 years and uh, this photograph hadn't been made? And the implication was that it had been made and they were hiding it from us. Uh, <laughs> and then I uh, printed those buttons up in the next week and made some kind of posters, and I went and started selling those buttons for 25 cents a piece from a sandwich board at Sailor Gate at UC Berkeley and then at Stanford and at MIT and Harvard Square in Columbia University and uh, got in the newspapers, the Village Voice, and um, I sent 
uh, buttons to various people, including Buckminster Fuller and Marshall McLuhan. I sent them to senators and congressmen and to their secretaries. I sent them to people at NASA. I sent them to people in the Politburo in Moscow. And um, anyway, it was just a campaign. So then when the photographs from Apollo started to come in, good color photographs of the Earth from the moon missions, um, I was sort of proven right that uh, it would make a difference. And indeed, it reframed everything, I think. Up till then in my lifetime, the sort of way you thought about the planet, planet's fate was in terms of the mushroom cloud of atomic bombs. And from 1969, 1970 on, the image now that we think about the Earth's fate where there's no longer mushroom clouds, it's, it's the photographs of the Earth from outside. You mentioned Buckminster Fuller, and mm -hmm. uh, he seems to have uh, been very, very influential in, uh, or had an influence certainly on you in some way. Uh, what was most striking about him, or what did you take, what have you taken from Buckminster Fuller? You know, there's a wonderful chapter in uh, Peter Drucker's early memoir, which he called something like Observations of a Bystander. And in it, he has a um, chapter about the hippie generation and about two of his friends, uh, which was Marshall McLuhan and Buckminster Fuller. And he said, McLuhan and Fuller were these two voices in the wilderness shouting away uh, with nobody listening. And he said uh, both of them would turn up at his door and come in and sort of uh, you know, rant their various rants at him. And he would patiently listen to them and encourage them and show them the door. Uh, and what happened in the 60s is um, artists that I was hanging out with in New York, a group called USCO, uh, were paying close attention to both Marshall McLuhan and Buckminster Fuller. And they were regarding how we thought about being artists. Um, Peter Drucker's perspective was that this was the first generation to take sort of technology and engineering seriously um, as a, a, a guide to uh, important, helpful intellectual endeavor that up till then intellectuals had sort of looked down from a great height on, scientists looked down on engineers and uh, technology was seen as you know, something that one kind of suffered rather than grabbed and ran with. And um, he felt that the 60s generation uh, reverse that, that we started to grab pieces of technology and run to our own horizons with them. And we're uh, ready to listen to prophets of that, such as Marshall McLuhan saying that the medium is the message, and Buckminster Fuller saying that uh, if all the politicians in the world died next week, the world would barely notice, but if all the scientists and engineers in the world died next week, the world would cease to function. Um, that was a big part of you know what the whole Earth catalog took on, uh, much more from Fuller than from McLuhan in that sense. <clears throat> Though I later got to know both of them, especially Bucky. Uh, there's there's a quote that I found that may or may not be relevant, but I'd love to explore it a little bit, and that is. I believe attributed to you. You you can't change human nature, but you can change tools. You can change techniques, and then by so doing, you can change civilization. Uh, is that something you could expand on? Uh, and related to that is, do you think of thinking as one such tool that you could change instead of human nature? I'd just love to know where that oh. came from or how it applies in your own mind. Um, that definitely comes directly from Fuller. Fuller That's said that Fuller. a lot of basic, yeah. yeah, that the changing human nature is, is hard and uh, when you try, you mostly fail and it's discouraging. <clears throat> changing tools and technology is relatively easy and you can enable things. Um, and so we saw that played out in the 70s uh, when the new left was still uh, in vogue and seemingly powerful and 
personal computers were coming on. And so here in the Bay Area, you had uh, people in Berkeley uh, demonstrating and saying power to the people. And you had uh, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak basically saying um, power to people. Uh, just provide the tools and the rest will come. That's been a pretty reliable framing. Um, a later version of that that I came up with is my sort of proclamation that science is the only news. <laughs> um, <laughs> all, all the other stuff, the politics goes in cycles. The fashion goes in very, very tight little cycles. Um, and even the, the technology is pretty predictable if, you, if you've got a good eye on what the science is up to. Um, so the, that's, in a sense, moving almost from a grab tools and run with them to uh, tools are arriving all the time, just pay attention. Uh, and that's, uh, I think, where most of what we consider progress uh, comes from. Now, does that apply to thinking? And I ask because of the seminars about long-term thinking. Yeah. Well, that's for busted. Okay, I was about to say no. <laughs> Clearly, I can't. <laughs> I got to hang out with um, people in the Bay Area at SRI in the late 60s who were doing a thing called Augmented Human Intellect. This was Doug Engelbart and his merry band at uh, Stanford Research Institute. And, um, and now... That, that has then played out, and so John Markoff came out with this good book a year or two ago called Machines of Loving Grace, which basically um, is spelling out the, the ongoing debate between uh, artificial intelligence and basically intelligence augmentation, um, IA and AI, um, augmented intelligence. So... Augmented intelligence, I think, has been going on ever since humans got around to uh, developing language. And uh, that then becomes individual intelligence, becomes much more social intelligence. I think almost all intelligence is social intelligence anyway. Uh, and their uh, personal computers came along. They were mainly a communication device. They did some calculation and some modeling and games and whatnot, uh, but mainly how the goddess was, you know, email and then the web and then on and on. Um, social intelligence is really easily augmented with tools. Now, what do you do with social intelligence? Can you change that? And that's something you're in the business of, and I suppose I'm in the business of to a lesser degree. The idea of the Long Now Foundation is to kind of give uh, encouragement and permission to a society that is rewarded for thinking very, very rapidly um, in business terms and in, indeed in scientific terms uh, to you know, a rapid turnaround, to get inside the adversary's uh, loop and uh, move fast and uh, break things. And um, the long-term thinking might be proposing uh, some things you probably don't want to break. <laughs> 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 and they might involve moving slow and steadily. Uh, I think climate change is the one that our century, our generation has been handed as a thing to which there is no quick fix whatsoever. Uh, it's a big, slow problem caused by absolutely everybody, and any solution is going to have to be big and slow and caused by approximately everybody. Um, so that is, uh, that's not tool, that's, that's circumstance, that's situational. But I think what we're proposing is that there are a lot of problems, a lot of issues, or a lot of quite wonderful things in that category of being big and slow moving. And uh, so I wound up 
with Brian Eno developing a, a, a pace layered diagram of civilization where there's the fast moving parts like fashion and commerce and then it goes kind of slower when you get to infrastructure and then things move really slow in how governance changes and then you get down to culture, language and religion move really, really slowly and then nature with tectonic forces and climate change and so on just really big and slow. And what's interesting about that is is that the fast parts get all the attention, but the slow parts have all the power. And uh, if you want to really deal with the powerful forces in the world, uh, in relation to uh, seeing what can be done with appreciating and maybe helping adjust the big slow things. So when you look, for instance, if somebody wanted to start exploring some of the slower moving layers and topics. You've been mm -hmm. curating SALTS, which I referred to earlier, the seminars about long-term thinking, and mm -hmm. you've released a very affordable book. It's basically a, a collection of summaries. I think it's two ninety nine dollars of mm -hmm. many of the talks at this point, which include, I mean, you name it, Michael Pollan, Matt Ridley. Uh, it's a very, very long list. Uh, are Tim there, Ferriss. Tim Ferriss. And <laughs> there you have yeah. it, about on meta-learning, which was a lot of fun. And is uh -huh. a great honor. Uh, who, are there any particular, uh, for people who wanted to perhaps take a break from the perishable goods of so-called news, non-scientific news and fashion and all of that noise to think about the slower moving, extremely powerful layers, are there any talks that you might suggest they, they start with or any summaries? Hmm, I'd have to scroll through them, but uh, one that comes to mind is Matt Ridley talking about rational optimism. Um, uh, there's a, a good one uh, by Ian Morris on uh, basically how the West uh, sort of won the world for now. Um, it's a sort of Jared Diamond level of understanding of how civilization is has moved in relation really to the to the makeup of the planet. Uh, Jared Diamond's own, Jared gave one of the talks on, uh, and the, the main one I think is his Guns, Germs, and Steel book, though his Collapse book also has some interesting stuff to propose. Um, I'd have to go down the list. Do you have some that you particularly like? Oh, well, I'm, I mean, I'm looking for a shopping list, basically, because I've, I, I think in the last few months become particularly sensitive to the fact that I've been pulled out by the riptide of uh, noise, I think. And I'm, so I'm, I'm actually looking for a <laughs> homework list from you uh, more than anything else. Uh, well, I'm looking at the seminar's homepage and uh, at the Long Now Foundation, and we've done, I guess, 120, 130 of these talks now, and they're about as long as this broadcast. They're 90 minutes in the sense, so it's long form. It's like long form TED Talks. They're illustrated, so there's really good uh, uh, edited uh, videos of them. But a lot of people use the iPod, I'm sure, as they do with your stuff, you know, when they're writing to work or something like that. Um, but just some of the recent ones, uh, Jim Glick uh, did a version of his book, Time Travel. It's some of the most cogent thinking about time that I think we've seen in, in a long time. Um, uh, Kevin Kelly has done two or three now. Um, Jesse Ossible did one on how nature is rebounding. Uh, it's, it's not widely known that we're pretty much at peak uh, farmland now, and that's fantastic. Uh, as more and more of these uh, bat-grown or lab-grown synthetic meats come along, I think we'll, we'll start to be uh, have fewer of the landscape being given over to grazing, uh, which will then free up a lot of nature, which is where I like to see things happening. Jeffrey West, uh, his book, Scale, uh, he did a talk version of that, which is fantastic, particularly uh, he focused on cities and how cities are... Uh, quite different from businesses in the sense that as they get bigger, they become even more innovative, whereas when companies get bigger, they become less innovative. 
and he's a theoretical physicist who has developed a, a scale, a logarithmic scale model of understanding of how that happens and why that is the case. Stuff like that. So uh, these are, I, I, I need to immediately after we're done talking, jump back in because I've been uh, feeling a deep hunger for revisiting and, well, visiting for the first time a lot of these. You mentioned Kevin. Say why, because you're uh, tired of the daily melodrama in the White House or what? <laughs> I'm tired of daily melodrama, period. Uh, I think that mm. whether it's self-manufactured emergencies or anxiety – or shiny objects well, that are distractions. Uh, I've actually, uh -huh. and I, I don't want to take us too off the rails, but I mean, I've been, I hesitate to use the word mysticism. You mentioned that after having some of these psychedelic experiences, you felt like you'd peek behind the curtain in a sense, and that uh, some of the uh, maybe appeal or uh, draw of mysticism was decreased. I've I've had the opposite experience uh, and huh. have been increasingly drawn to reading about definitions of reality and looking at perception and the doors of perception and and really trying to pull back from. I was just chatting with uh, Tim O'Reilly about this actually, but the if if we huh. if we were to look at say reality. And then one abstraction of that being our personal experience as perceived through the senses and then language and additional abstraction on top of that. Uh, I've been trying to return to, uh, I hate to use this term, but I'm not coming up with anything better on the spot, uh, source or the le layer of least abstraction uh, to, stu to study that to the extent possible because I think it, it informs everything else that's Upstream. Um, so, if we're so there's probably a book or two that is speaking to you at this point. What what are they? Uh, well, I I will tell you that uh, I've been reading. So there, there are there are books that are speaking to this, uh, but they might not be what people would expect. They're not. They're actually not nonfiction. I think I've tried to look in nonfiction for answers, mm. but. There is a very kinesthetic feeling of greater truth, which will make certain rationalists out there just drop their jaws open. But I've spent my whole life operating out of my prefrontal cortex and using spreadsheets and pro and con lists and so on. And I've, I think that for a long time I viewed my emotions or intuition or feelings as a liability and distraction and nothing else. And I've come to believe otherwise. Uh, so I'm, I've actually spent a lot of time reading... Uh, certain poetry, uh, which is very much not anything who grew up with me would associate with me, but also reading uh, fic highly autobiographical fiction that questions the nature of perception. For instance, Milan Kundera's The Book of Laughter and Forgetting is, I think, just uh -huh. a tremendous, uh, tremendous work that is, it uses hilarity and absurdity to teach a lot. Uh, so the, that's one that comes to mind because I literally just finished it yesterday and it's sitting on my table. Uh, but what, what, what books are you drawn to right now? Mm. I'll come to that. I want to um, say a little more about uh, what you're talking about is taking comfort in, uh, in the larger frame, the longer frame. And uh, apparently there's some research done in this a few years back. Danny Hillis has referred to I've never seen the actual research. But um, when people are doing something they care about for a long-term institution they care about, might be a church, might be a branch of military they're in, uh, might be the U.S. government, um, might be a species they're dedicated to, uh, they take comfort in engaging the time frame of that institution or thing. And I think one of the comforts maybe uh, when you're dealing with an institution that's lived longer than any human uh, or a natural system that's obviously been longer even than humans themselves have been around, and uh, you extend your mind back through the the narrative, the sequence of events, the story of that thing, and then you extend it forward, 
when you extend it forward, you, you go buy a thing which might otherwise obsess you, which is your own personal death. And um, denial of, of death is a big event, and things that sort of finesse death without denying it by you know, taking on the life of something that lives longer than you do. Um, people get this from their children and grandchildren, obviously. Um, that's why the loss of a child is, is harder on a parent than any other thing, I think. But this is a, um, a place that, that people like to abide from time to time, and uh, it's, it also feels like the opposite of the daily melodrama, uh, which has its own attractions, God knows. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, it's just part of balance, I think, is having this other frame of reference. And some get it from religion, some get it from you know, Vipassana meditation, and some get it from cleaving to a, 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 a long-term thing, a species or a, an institution. Um, I think that's one of the reasons that uh, the Long Now Foundation, which is, a, you know, kind of a strange thing that it would be successful is that, it, that it's what all it's doing is saying long-term thinking is probably good. <laughs> uh, uh, let's build a 10,000 year clock and uh, see if that helps. Uh, and a surprising number of people say, oh, good idea. And then want to engage in some fashion, either by listening to these talks or becoming members or eventually when the clock is finished in a few years going and you know, hanging out with the clock. Um, in my case, I'm trying to bring back woolly mammoths, and that's going to take a couple of centuries. Uh, so I'll, I'll just get out a start on that when I'm 78. Uh, that's comforting. That's, uh, there's so many different directions we could go with this. I want. To, I know. I, that, I, that was, no, I know. I can I, see them branching out in your mind. I there. know the de <laughs> the dendrites of possibilities are branching out, and I think I think I'm going to go. Much like the parachute not opening, I feel like for the people listening, I have to address the woolly mammoth. <laughs> so, yeah. So that, um, so thank you for that easy option. Uh, and I, I, uh, I shouldn't assume, but I will. If is this related to Revive and Restore? Yeah, Revive and Restore is an organization that uh, my wife Ryan Phelan runs that we've been working on for for almost five years now to basically bring uh, genetic technology to wildlife conservation. And the general term for what we do and, and the, the sub-discipline that's opening up in conservation biology is called genetic rescue. And uh, mainly you're focusing on other uh, work, genetic workarounds for uh, inbreeding depression in uh, small populations that one would like to have come back to be large populations. You know, maybe there's just a small group of California condors left in captive breeding, and then you want to get them back out to the wild, which has now happened. And the genetic monitoring of that helps with the breeding program, for example. Uh, head off diseases to maybe dial down a severe, uh, severely destructive, invasive uh, rodents on uh, ocean islands, for example, things like that you can do with genetics, in that case maybe with gene drive, which is a very aggressive form of genetic intervention. Um, and then the extreme case is because we now have recoverable DNA from animals that have gone extinct, whether well, it was just a hundred years ago like the passenger pigeon or several thousand years ago like the woolly mammoths, and if there are close relatives of those extinct animals that are still living, and they have working genomes. Uh, in the case of the woolly mammoth, it's Asian elephants. Um, then you can contemplate, or in our case, uh, working with George Church at Harvard, begin to apply the taking of the most mammothy of the mammoth genes, identifying them, and uh, using editing tools like CRISPR uh, move those genes basically into the genomes of living elephant cells, uh, moving in the direction of uh, eventually being able to get a, um, a cell with the nucleus that is basically woolly mammoth uh, genome, and then getting that into a living 
uh, Asian elephants who can then give birth to woolly mammoths. Obviously, this would go through many steps. And then move from there through the re standard reintroduction techniques of wildlife conservation to get the woolly mammoths up to a population that is self-sustaining, has enough genetic variability that they will uh, you know, not get into an inbreeding bottleneck and start the process of reintroducing them to their wild, which was the, the far north, where there's not a lot of people, so they'd uh, be able to perhaps prosper pretty well. And eventually, uh, the rest of that story is the woolly mammoths could be part of the revival of what used to be called the mammoth steppe, which is the grasslands of the far north that was once the largest biome on Earth. But when humans uh, got through all of that biome and killed off all of the large megafauna, except for the muskox, uh, that grassland turned into tundra and boreal forest. Um, Mammoths would be helpful as we bring back the various grazers to the far north, like the muskox and maybe the woolly, mammoth, the woolly rhinoceros. Uh, the mammoths are good, as elephants were good all over the world. Uh, everybody had, had elephants. Uh, and what they're good at is knocking down trees. And knocking down trees is good because it turns a closed canopy forest into a mosaic. And a mosaic, ecologically, is a much richer environment for all kinds of species as we see in, in uh, the parts of Africa that uh, have these animals. And the far north could be uh, like the Serengeti is now. So that's that'll take a while, but I think we'll probably do it. So, so to um, those people who are feel fearful of some of what they perceive as implications of this, um, to someone who might say, for instance, we couldn't have predicted when we were eliminating these species, or we didn't predict the downstream mm -hmm. effects. How can we be confident in predicting the uh, the consequences of reintroducing, say, megafauna like the woolly mammoth? Um, what what is the response to that? Well, that that. A uh, statement that analysis is usually based on the, and you see this also with the climate, yep. uh, this is a system so complex that we don't understand it, and if you screw around with a complex system, you will have unintended consequences that you'll just hate. And uh, if that approach were completely adopted, there would be no human medicine, because uh, for sure the human body is a, a very complex system of which we have at best partial knowledge. But well, we screw around with it all the time, and uh, that's why I and any number of people are still alive. Because <laughs> medical interventions uh, were made that uh, we were, you know, had reason to think might work out, and uh, thanks to a lot of science over a lot of time and a lot of failures, uh, they do work out. So what you do with a complex system you don't completely understand is you tweak it and uh, see what the tweak does. And tweaking is good because uh, it's probably not going to cause a major change. It will cause a small local change. You can see how it works. And um, ecology is not a predictive science, but it is a great observational science. And so, uh, like with the human body, you do these experiments, see what happens, and then build on your successes and work around your failures, kind of normal. And I should say, I'm taking a devil's advocate position. Uh, there are also some, there are uh, observational data sets that you can pull from that don't involve genetic rescue, f f incorporating something like CRISPR, but say the reintroduction of wolves to certain parts of uh, Yellowstone and how that affected, uh, say, elk or deer populations, which affected grazing, which affected ultimately the paths of rivers and so on. I mean, it's fascinating. Uh, there's some really uh, engaging uh, video, video uh, that, that discusses that. Uh, now, is the woolly mammoth a... How much of the interest in the woolly mammoth specifically is about uh, an input that has a very strong output, say, uh, ecologically, <laughs> versus just a fascination with the woolly mammoth? Um, there's no end of fascination with the woolly mammoth because there's no end of fascination with elephants, as there will should be. These are you know, just 
anybody who's really spent time with elephants fall, falls in love with elephants. And um, in Asia, the Asian elephants have been you know, a partially domesticated animal for a long time. And the fact that uh, it is still endured beside, uh, along with the fact that about 100 people are killed by elephants in Asia every year, um, suggests that you know, not only are they uh, useful, they are loved. And um, in Africa, they don't kill people quite as much, but there's a, a certain amount of death and destruction that happens with them there. So uh, you know, let's have an open mind about uh, that there's downsides as well as upsides for having an elephant in your life. But uh, humans and elephants have lived together for a long time, and mostly we know how to do that. And they are uh, safest for themselves and for us when they are in wildernesses that they pretty much own. Uh, and the, the far north, the Arctic and subarctic regions would be swell for that in terms of woolly mammoths. Um, I think I went so astray from your question, I lost track of what it was. Oh, that's again. okay. Uh, the, the, I think the, the question was how much of it was a strategic decision for the impact the woolly mammoth could have versus a personal interest or passion for the woolly mammoth that is unrelated to its impact if reintroduced. Well, there's a, a scale issue here, which as a lifelong conservationist I'm concerned about, which is um, we hear about biodiversity a lot, but I, I want to reintroduce the idea of bioabundance. And one of the uh, important plants that's being brought back genetically is the American chestnut which used to be one quarter of all the trees in the eastern deciduous forest, there where you are. And uh, then a blight came along from Asia that killed them. Uh, basically, uh, they're, they're evolutionarily still around, but ecologically they're extinct. But um, a workaround was found to make uh, American chestnuts that are now completely blight-proof. And those are being bred up, and because they're a food plant, People eat chestnuts roasting on the open fire. Uh, they are going through the government you know, regulation process, but should be, uh, they're getting back into the wild already. And what they will do is not just introduce one tiny element of biodiversity, the eastern forest, they will introduce um, food that comes raining down, sweet nuts that everybody eats, including humans. And uh, when they all died off, the animals that lived on those nuts had to start making do with acorns, which happen only from time to time, and they're bitter. So the the richness of the eastern forest will be made much more bioabundant as these trees come back. The same is true, as you mentioned, with bringing wolves back to Yellowstone. Uh, the same is very much true bringing beavers back to Scotland and now to England. Uh, they've been reintroduced in Sweden, and they are what are called ecosystem engineers that make the ponds, that cut down some of the trees, that make a whole rich environment for lots of other species along with themselves. And I would like to, everybody who's been on safari in Africa, whether it's South Africa or Kenya or Tanzania, has had an experience of wildlife on the land where my God, there's hippos and giraffes and rhinos and lions and elephants and uh, a lot of big animals moving around, dealing with one another. Wildebeest in you know huge herds like American bison used to be in the U.S. And um, the whole world was like that. It's just a remnant in Africa of what the, world, the entire world was like. I think a whole lot of the world can be that again with the large animals. Um, and that's sort of my long-term goal. Uh, as it happens, one of the largest of the uh, land animals is woolly mammoths. And it looks like they're a relatively straightforward one to bring back. So there you have it. One big animals. <laughs> Mammoth is a good place to start. <laughs> uh, thank you. That's extremely helpful. And I'd, I'd love to expand from that to a discussion of, uh, for lack of a better term, environmentalism in general. Uh, and 
this is a quote. Feel free to correct it because often quotes are misquotes. But uh, his, that's you, Stuart, his own big idea is that the best approach to the issues he discusses is pragmatism. He fleshes it out by example rather than by discussing its philosophical defense by John Dewey or William <laughs> James. He reckons it is an engineer's approach, accepting whatever gets results. For environmentalists, he suggests it means not a shift in ideology, but discarding ideology completely. And the part that grabbed my attention here is the it means not a shift in ideology but discarding ideology uh, uh, ideology completely and i was wondering if you could uh talk a bit about that and what you mean by it um i was part of the creation i guess um of the so-called modern environmental movement in the 60s and 70s um and a couple of things got brought into the environmental movement kind of by proximity and osmosis. So there was a uh, a leftist perspective that came in from the new left at the time. And so a lot of the environmental movement was sort of knee-jerk, anti-corporate, anti-business. And um, there was a lot of romanticism that came from the hippies of back to the land and uh, a lot of that kind of stuff and that romanticism and turned into a certain amount of anti-technology and even anti-science. Um, to be one with nature is to you know, dissolve yourself in the nature that is already there and don't fuck with it. Uh, and any kind of intervention or any kind of a reliance on Technology was regarded as a quote techno fix and therefore contemptible. Uh, that set of framings um, kind of got set in concrete and greatly outlived their usefulness and started to get in the way. So in 2010, I came out with a, a book that was basically about the rise of eco pragmatism that I called Whole Earth Discipline. And was looking at things that I thought uh, looked like environmentalists uh, just had wrong. Uh, we had wrong that uh, genetic engineering was a bad thing and agriculture GMOs were thought to be bad, starting with the Friends of the Earth and then spreading from there. I saw how that happened at the time. Uh, nuclear was thought to be bad. Uh, and when climate change came along and it was the shortest cut to being able to really, really reduce um, emissions of greenhouse gases, it was discounted for reasons left over from an earlier time. Uh, cities uh, were taken as the problem rather than the solution, but when you look at the demographics, cities are the solution. They're the greenest thing that humans do. And uh, geoengineering, of, of intervening in the climate directly to buy ourselves more time to cut down our emissions, was taken as some kind of profound abomination. And as Al Gore told me, Brand, you want to experiment with the whole planet? Don't do it. Um, well, you know, again, this is like we were saying about uh, what we do with ecosystems. You tweak things and see what works and then go in the direction of what works and avoid what is not working. So um, I think the environmental movement, to the extent that it can even be called a single thing anymore, is um, catching up to the real world. And um, that's taking a whole lot longer than I would have liked. But I think reality, and especially in terms of climate, is just going to keep hammering us. Well, I, it seems to me that looking at the projects you're currently involved with, looking at the projects that you've been involved with, you're very good at enlisting the help and collaboration of other people. And I, uh, I asked Kevin Kelly, uh, if there were any particular questions or topics or facets of your life that might be fun 
to explore. And one one of the bullets that came back was very few humans have ever turned down a request by Stuart. How is he so persuasive? And I'll just le- I'll leave it at that. I I don't know how to how to really dig into that. So I I can try, but let me just keep it general. Why does why does Kevin have that perception of you, and why are you, if that's the case, hmm. so effectively persuasive? Do you think? No, I don't know. I get I get nervous. Um, I don't ask that much. Um, basically, I invite people to give these seminars about long term thinking, and um, it's kind of like being invited to give a TED talk. That it's not that hard to say yes because uh, you'll get a nice audience for being invited to be on on this show. Um, I do run into a fair amount of uh, people who feel one form or another of kind of gratitude and maybe admiration for the whole Earth Catalog back in the day. And so um, a number of years ago when I asked Craig Venter to uh, give a salt talk, I was surprised to hear him sort of leaping and uh, into saying yes. And it turned out uh, he's of a generation who got his twig bent by uh, the whole Earth Catalog, and uh, you know, felt like he felt good about payback. So a certain amount goes with that. Um, other stuff has to do with just being around and kind of being public for decade after decade. You get kind of known and, and recognized enough where you don't sort of have to establish your bona fides. Um, uh, over time, because that's already been done. I don't think it's more profound than that. Well, at the same time, though, I could say you've been in the public and met many, 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 many people, interacted with a huge group of individuals. Uh, when most people have that much interaction over a long period of time, you, sometimes you make mistakes, maybe people meet you on a bad day, uh, you don't seem to have, and this is maybe a strong wording, but you don't seem to have any known enemies, uh, if that makes sense. <laughs> I've never heard someone attack you, and I'm, maybe that's just because I haven't come across it. Uh, why do you think? Why do you think that's the case? And even if that isn't the case, why is that the perception? Um, well, I'm not powerful or rich. So, uh, you know, the enemies that go with uh, position of power, <laughs> there's nothing to, uh, you know, resist. And uh, the resentment that goes with a certain kind of uh, wealth is not there either. Um, I've certainly had people who've strongly opposed me on certain things, sometimes publicly. Mostly, I, I, I think that, you know, my successes have been public and my failures have been private so uh, <laughs> from the outside it looks like uh, you know lots of good things um, can you I don't really know yeah can I've, you... I've not been associated I guess with things that were uh, I'd later wish that I hadn't been um, or the other people wish that I had not been and, you know, so the main politician that I've worked closely with is Jerry Brown. Well, you know, neither he nor I are suffering from his reputation in that respect. Um, so my associations have worked out uh, very well, and I guess I'm lucky. Do you have any particular failure that you could share which uh, greatly informed your life after you experienced it or something that could be something that set you up for later success or just a failure that taught you a lot in some way or another? Um, I failed to finish ranger training in the army and I uh, quit partway through after the sort of early getting into it stuff. Ranger training is much harder now than it was then. Uh, airborne training and jump training is pretty much the same now that it was then. But, um, it was uh, five weeks, six weeks or something, you know, pretty intense stuff. And about halfway through, after having finished the five-mile run part and the uh, saving myself from drowning in 32-degree water with weighed down with ammunition uh, uh, bags and all of that, um, 
one day I just quit. And um, I think it, the, what I told myself was that it was, uh, this was January or February in, at Fort Benning, which I uh, think was south, nice and warm. It was freezing cold, and we're out in it. And I was thinking I was not learning much because it was so cold. So that was a stupid excuse. I gave myself to quit. And um, what I and uh, it's like all of these intense uh, military training, the SEAL do or the Delta or any of those guys do. If you say I don't want to do this anymore, you are gone in about thirty seconds, <laughs> <laughs> which is the right thing to do. Uh, and so what I learned from that is um, don't quit anything for a snap decision reason. Uh, I quit lots of stuff, including many successes, but I don't do it on a snap decision anymore. Can you think of uh, a, let's see, a project or anything that you were involved with later where you had the impulse to quit and what was behind it and then what you did instead? making noise because uh, <laughs> <laughs> trying to avoid radio silence here while I ponder if there's something I wanted. I could also I could also come back to that and buy some time if you like. Sure, let's buy time because I'm not getting anything immediate. All right. I'll, so I'm going to buy time since we were talking about physical training. Uh, to confirm one thing, which is you're, are you currently 78? Is that right? Correct. Okay. And you do CrossFit twice a week? That's correct. All right. Now, I guess two two questions related to CrossFit. One is because you seem to thrive on variety, and uh, like you mentioned, you get bored of say snowboarding because mm. it's up down up down up down. Right. Uh, what what appeals to you about CrossFit? Number one, and then number two, do you have any favorite exercises or workouts? Oh, good God! Um, well, the main. In relation to getting bored, the wonderful thing about CrossFit, it, for me, among other things, is that uh, it's a different set of exercises that you encounter every single time. So I've been going for two, two and a half years now, and um, I do not you know, look online to see what the workout is going to be. I show up and, and I have my jump rope and uh, I'm going to do whatever's there that day, and it's always different. And uh, that plus, because um, you're doing it with other people in a competitive mode, there's a social aspect to it, and uh, there's going to be a different group of people in the two days a week I go, some of the same, uh, you know, hi, Nick, hi, Casey, uh, and some that are different. And um, the competitive aspect uh, that you're going against time uh, and keeping score uh, helps keep it interesting. It's a very impressive program. It's a genius program uh, in terms of uh, getting rid of a lot of the spurious stuff of gyms so there's no machines, uh, there's no mirrors. Well, there are rowing machines, but that's it. Um, there's free weight work, and the free weight work is not only straightforward strength, but the coordination to manage free weight so you don't have the machine doing the managing part for you. Um, and I, I made a huge difference for me uh, when I started it at 75. Of uh, Suddenly I was, within a few months, 30 pounds lighter. And I'm 157 pounds now, which is the weight I was when I started the whole Earth Catalog at the age of 30. And um, and then you, know, you stand different, as as you know, when you work out. Um, and I pre one of the things I learned to appreciate in, in the military was uh, you know, being able to uh, stand like you mean it. You know, stand like you mean it. You've got to be fit. And... Uh, that just makes all the difference. My, my own sense is that, I, I, certainly for males and maybe for anybody, um, being a, having a certain amount of fitness and strength makes you proud. And uh, being proud is the uh, most reliable source of happiness that I know. 
so the CrossFit is fascinating to me on many different levels. And I, well, no, well, I had my first CrossFit workout in uh, ninety nine or two thousand. I want to say it was around two thousand in Mountain View at a Half Gracie Jiu Jitsu Academy, where a number of the guys were going to Santa Cruz to train with a bunch of the original uh, CrossFit crew. And uh, uh-huh. it's it's morphed a lot over time, but at uh, I remember in that year and maybe the year after how many people talked about how there was no demand for yet another group exercise program. And <laughs> it made me think of how Starbucks was turned down by many, 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 many different investors who said, really, another coffee chain? Nobody needs that. And uh-huh. uh, this leads me to want to ask you about, and I would love for you to describe it a little bit for people who are not familiar with it. You mentioned a name earlier on, uh, which was uh, Doug Engelbart. And uh-huh. you were present for what has been called the mother of all demos. And right. I'd love for you to describe for people what that was and what the experience uh, and feeling was for you and other people in the room, because what I don't know, because I haven't read much about it, is if if people realized the implications of what they were witnessing. Um, so if if you could kind of take it from here and tell us the story, I'd, that would be great. Yeah, so uh, beginning with uh, Starbucks and, and CrossFit, um, the difference between a good idea and good execution, <laughs> right. or even a bad idea and good execution. Uh, the execution on CrossFit was uh, impeccable, and you being there at the start of it is impressive. Uh, the, there's a nice book on it by J.C. Hertz called Learning to Breathe Fire, which pretty much tells the story of how CrossFit came about. Um, and the the title refers to that uh, something I saw in the military and learned to appreciate there when I was taught basic training, which is the, if you can take people and force them beyond, uh, get them in a situation where they go beyond their expectations of what they're capable of, uh, the world opens up for them. And that's one of the things that we did with basic training. And I would see these trainees come in from Brooklyn and so on. And uh, you know, we would push them, and uh, they would discover that there was so much more that they could do with their bodies and under certain circumstances with their minds than they thought. And uh, and then they, you know, they, they started to grow toward infinity with that realization. So CrossFit uh, does that for a lot of people. It's uh, quite intense, and that intensity, as you know, um, uh, once you realize you can do stuff that, didn't think you could do, then uh, things open up. So the mother of all demos was a 1969 Fall Joint Computer Conference. And this was a demonstration where a group at SRI um, that I got to be part of as a sort of a advisor and, and, and filmer um, showed the results of about three or four years of work doing what Doug Engelbuck called augmented human intellect. And he was using uh, mainframe and mini computer capabilities to um, do interactive text, Windows. Uh, they developed, he and his, his leading engineer, Bill English, developed to the mouse. And uh, he gave a demo that was about an hour and a half long uh, in San Francisco that is the greatest high wire act you've ever seen because <laughs> they had developed the computer that was running the demo was not in San Francisco. It was 30 miles south in Menlo Park. And Bill English had developed the a microwave capability to get the data flowing back and forth between uh, San Francisco and Menlo Park so that uh, the computer-generated demo was, uh, was happening. Well, that was a very uh, 
a tin cans and string kind of connection. <laughs> and so getting it to uh, you know the edge of capability and then maintaining it for an hour and a half was astonishing in its own right. So Bill English or uh, Bill English was in the room and was in Doug Engelbart's ear. He is uh, on the stage and also on the projected screen, and uh, his face is being cut in and out of the visuals that he is working. He's showing how uh, you can create text, change text, make various files, move the files around, connect them to other people. He's showing a, a uh, the mouse. He's showing a keyboard he developed that's a one-handed keyboard. And um, all of the time that he's going through the, his spiel, which we had rehearsed, once or twice, but it was basically him just telling uh, a play out of the work that he and the team had been developing for three or four years. It was hanging over the raggedy edge the whole time. So every now and then, Bill, <laughs> Bill would whisper into his ear, um, we lost signal from Middle Park, fake it for a while. And uh, and Doug would just launch into a uh, some encomiums for the people that he worked with, and you know, holding forth on that while his computer came back up. Uh, it, it really was a, an awesome demo. I was not in the room; I was uh, in Menlo Park filming that parts of the action ah, and uh, you know, hands-on keyboards and what was on the screen and stuff like that. So at the end of it. Um, uh, you know, I was just hearing the voice of a person who was in communication with Bill English, who was in communication with Doug on the stage. Uh, and then everything kind of wound down, and, and we're looking around. Is it over? Yeah, it's over. Well, did they like it? Oh, just a sec, I'll check. And uh, it turns out that in the room, it had been a standing ovation and minds blown and Alan Kay, you know, redirecting his entire career and various people getting completely knocked out and blown away by it all. Uh, but down in Menlo Park, it was uh, Hatcher came back. Um, yeah, apparently they liked it. Good night, everybody. <laughs> so we just we, we just all wandered home. <laughs> oh wow! Just another day in the office. Let's go get some pizza. Thank God it's over. Yeah, basically, you know, we'd worked hard and it's done now. Phew. <laughs> All right. So I I want to mention one thing about uh, just to just to come back because I'll feel uh, I, I feel a duty just to say one more thing about CrossFit, which is uh, hmm. cro there are a lot of incredible things uh, and benefits associated with CrossFit. I think there is a risk that people should be aware of, which is the ideology of our way is the only way. So there is a bit of a, a culture of intolerance around some people who practice CrossFit. And so I would just caution people to be aware of that so that they don't develop a, a myopic approach to fitness. And, um, I know a lot of people who are involved with CrossFit, I, but I've also, for instance, after one, podcast I did and the, the headline of which was the good, the bad and the ugly of CrossFit had, uh, the founder of CrossFit reach out to schedule a phone call. And I thought it was going to be because the podcast was very, uh, complimentary that it would be a conversation about maybe doing something on the podcast or something else. And instead it was this very sort of threatening call because of the headline, even though they had not listened to the audio. Uh, so I would just caution people about, anything that paints a very black and white picture that is us versus them. That would just be my cautionary tale. Uh, on the mother of all demos and moving back into tech a little bit though, uh, I would love to talk about the expression, uh, information wants to be free. Uh, can you comment on this phrase that is attributed to you, information wants to be free. And uh, also, if it is the entire quote, <laughs> because I, I've read that it is not. Uh, so if, if you could elaborate on that a bit, uh, I would certainly love to hear it. Well, it keeps coming up from time to time because um, 
there is a paradox out there of uh, information, especially on the web, just swarming around. And, um, you know, should there be paywalls for uh, scientific journals? And um, my feeling on that is there should not, by the way. But you can see why Elsevier and, and uh, other organizations that have paywalls about scientific journals are reluctant to take them down because they are extremely remunerative for those organizations. But I think they are bad for science. Uh, so that's a, a current application of, of this particular argument. Uh, the statement I made goes back to 1984 when Kevin Kelly and I and <clears throat> Ryan Phelan um, organized a thing called a hackers conference. It turned out to be the first hackers conference. It, that particular thing has carried on year to year since then. And uh, one of the people who came to the hackers conference was Steve Wozniak, along with uh, a lot of the great hackers at the time, and Leif Helsenstein and, and uh, uh, you know, the best reporter of all of that material, John. Markov was there, and, and, and. It's great. There's a good video on it you can find online. But in the course of it, uh, and there were a, a lot of kind of public discussions of the issues at the time being talked about. One of them was um, freeware, shareware, and then regular commercial uh, products. And Steve Wozniak was making the point that um, and copy protection was a, a big question that was going on around because copy protection would be put on software so you couldn't easily copy it and give it to your friends. But on the other hand, the copy protection then made it much less convenient to use as a tool, and that was a real debate. And Steve Wozniak was saying, quite right, look, the engineer puts a couple of years of work into one of these things. Uh, he or she, it was mostly he in those days, uh, should get some kind of remuneration, so it needs to be commercial. And... I, I apparently replied, um, that's right, information does want to be expensive, but information also wants to be free. And uh, as it gets easier and easier to copy anything that's digital and distribute it uh, equally easily, that debate is going to go on forever, that the information wants to be free and it wants to be expensive. And... Uh, Information, everybody knew that information uh, should be expensive. That was the standard commercial model. But the things that digital capabilities were bringing was that there could be vast quantities of information moved around freely. So information wants to be free became kind of a, a slogan or a motto or a something of the time, uh, a bumper sticker, a shortcut to dealing with a, a large phenomenon that was happening. Um, but the rest of it really was, and information wants to be expensive. And that relationship is not contradictory. It's paradoxical in the sense that uh, the more the one, the more the other. And uh, the more information wants to be free, the more it wants to be expensive because uh, there's that many more values to accrue to you know, very large audiences, etc. cetera. And um, it's a... I think a debate which is permanent. It's kind of like the debate itself around the term hacker. Is a hacker a good guy or a, or a, a, a criminal? And the answer is both. <laughs> uh, and information uh, does will continue to be uh, a source of major commercial activity and a source of uh, huge free available stuff. So... You know, my rule on Twitter is when I link to something, I only link to stuff that's uh, not behind paywalls. So you can go look at it itself. And probably once you get there, that source will you know, show you whatever I link to, and they'll beg you to subscribe and pay for their service, and you might do that. Yeah, I was mystified recently. Uh, I'm not going to mention the outlet because I, I might actually get it wrong, but it was a, sci a mainstream scientific publication that... <laughs> was only it was promoting articles in its Twitter account and they were all behind a paywall 
<laughs> yeah, I think that's kind of crazy. <laughs> and it drove me nuts because I said, look. It, it's tricky. I mean, you, you have publications like New Scientist, which is not really a, a strict scientific publication. It's a very good publication. Um, but uh, they pay well all their stuff. And as a result, I think they have a much smaller audience than um, things that look like they'll be want to be widely read by the public from Nature or Science Magazine. Um, often get out from behind the paywall, and that's good for science. It's good for public understanding of science. I think it's ultimately good for the publications because uh, people realize there's lots more good stuff where that one came from. Well, no, exactly. I mean, if you're trying to get someone hooked on a drug, whether that is a, a pharmaceutical or really good information in a curated and edited magazine, you, it's, it behooves you to give them a sample if it's really good enough to be addictive. So if you have a social account where you're only sharing things behind a paywall, there's no conceivable sort of user behavior that I can think of where they go click on a headline expecting to read an article. They don't get the article, and then they're asked to pay for it. <laughs> so by and, by and large, not. Every now and then, you know, you're so desperate to see it, you pay the twenty nine ninety five or whatever it is to see the thing, but you're... Uh, you know, you're angry. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I would love to, I suppose this is actually perhaps a good segue from, from angry or frustrated. A lot of people suffer from clutter and I have heard that even at the, the height of paper. So before most things or many things were digitized that you had a completely clean desk and that that is also true of your inbox. And Where I, did you hear that? <laughs> I, well, I don't want to incriminate anybody if it's not true. Do so, it. Tell me. <laughs> I'll track them down and, and wonder uh, what happened. <laughs> so, I, I, so is that is that not true? Is that not accurate? It's not accurate. Okay. Um, All, right. <laughs> All right. Well, then we can we can skip that if it's not accurate. But if you have any uh, organizational rules or principles that help you to keep your life in order or projects in order. Uh, maybe that's a graceful lateral move from what I guess is incorrect. Yeah, I think whatever systems I use are are, uh, are half crap, and uh, I, um, I have been rewarded for not getting rid of stuff, which is that uh, the guy who's actually suffering from most now, by the way, is John Markoff, because he's the guy who took on trying to write a biography of me. And um, it's, a, it's a fun book project where I get to sort of help in the research, but I don't have to do any of the work. Uh, but the poor guy is overloaded with material because uh, I've led a, actually relatively stable and continuous life in the Bay Area and um, semi-interesting stuff I just threw into boxes. And there's now, I gather, 70 linear feet at Stanford in their archives, and they've got probably another 100-plus feet of my papers uh, yet to come, notebooks that I kept every day, not every day, but that I've written in since I was in college and all that stuff. So um, having enough storage space to throw the interesting stuff uh with a remote idea might be eventually interesting to go back to turned out to, you know, which is, uh, you know, it's a cluttering, not a decluttering move. The, the decluttering move is to get the hell rid of it. Um, but anyway, it, uh, it gives poor John lots to work with. And the, I think a the result there is, is that, uh, he'll be able to tell a more accurate and probably less interesting story of me. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas if there was none of that stuff, it would all be hearsay, and hearsay is way more interesting than real things. <laughs> if if you were teaching a, uh, let's say, a freshman seminar in college, Stanford, wherever, you could take your pick, Berkeley, doesn't matter. You could teach anything you wanted. You could have a class size of any size. Uh, what would you teach and Why? Um, I don't think Western Civ is taught anymore. That would be probably called Global Civ now. But uh, it was a required course freshman year in 56 at Stanford for me. 
and um, it's a, a great thing to begin uh, a college undergraduate education with a sort of the overview of civilization so far. Um, and there was also a, a very good course on comparative religion taught by Frederick Spiegelberg that I took. And those two things um, are framing that uh, I, I'd love to see more of. I'm, I don't think I'm qualified to teach a thing like that. But uh, any, any person who takes on teaching something like that has you know, got some wonderful research to do. And you have a concept like big history now. Big history is basically everything from the Big Bang to uh, this week uh, put together in one uh, somewhat coherent narrative. And that's, uh, that's the kind of thing I think is, is helpful to have out there. I'm not a very good teacher. Uh, I can occasionally give an okay lecture, but teaching um, is a real talent as well as skill, and I have neither the talent nor the skill. <laughs> well, let's just pretend, though, that you had the talent and the skill, but as as you put it, you weren't qualified to teach Western civilization, but that if someone were to, they would have some wonderful research to do. Let's just pretend that, say, Stanford reaches out to you at some point after this podcast, and they say, great news, we would be honored if you would teach a class on Western civilization. You have time to prepare, and they caught you in a moment of weakness, so you agreed. If you had, say, a few months to prepare for that, what would you, how would you go about researching it? What would you read? Who would you talk to? Uh, what, would, what would your approach be? Well, Tim, this brings up another issue that I think not so many of your guests get into, which is at the age of 78, how many months do I have to prepare anything? My health is great, but, you know, the uh, actuarial tables are pretty clear. And um, I find myself not taking on uh, long-term commitments as much. Uh, there's a book I'd love to do. It would be called How to Be Rich Well. And uh, that would take three or four years of serious research and then probably two years of writing. And that's not actually what I want to do at the age of 78, with who knows how much time. So um, Kevin Kelly has probably put it to you, but he's put it to various people in a similar mode, which is that we both discovered that as you move from project to project in your life, the projects that look like they're, I mean, you start projects all the time. Most of them don't take. But the ones that take, that you find that you continue to be interested in, there's starting to be enough other people interested in that the thing kind of makes circuit with the world. They're starting to come to life. To follow through on it and make it really come to pass and, and be a thing in the world, it's going to take about five years, give or take. And... Um, at various times in your life, you have a sense of how many five years is left you might have. And uh, once you get into your 70s, that becomes a number of fingers on one hand kind of thing. So uh, one is not quite as, oh, yeah, I guess I'll really take on that huge uh, five-year commitment uh, that I may not live to finish, uh, just given the the way the statistics fall. So that's a different answer to your question. But um, there's, there's very good stuff in that line from Oliver Sacks in his last year when he was writing like mad the whole time that he knew he was dying. And I haven't read it all, but I saw glimpses of it. And he would say things like, I, there's some subjects I find I'm not interested in anymore because I really can't do anything about them, uh, such as climate change. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, you know, uh, stages of life is, uh, life extension folks are working away, but meanwhile, uh, mostly we're working with a finite resource here, and so that's part of life management is what you're doing with the time you've got. Kevin Kelly has a clock on his, uh, on his computer that is counting down to the day he dies according to the current actuarial tables. He knows how many hours more he's going to live. 
it acts accordingly. How do you choose your pro- how do you choose your commitments now? How do you filter what to say yes to or what to say no to? Well, the, there's a shift, I think, in most people's careers that actually are having a career if it involves um, responding to opportunities. In an early career, the, the algorithm is yes and less no. You, know, just, uh, you get invited to do something, um, of course, probably. Uh, so you say yes, and then you find out if it's actually maybe not such a good idea. But at a certain point, uh, that flips into no and less yes. <laughs> and so I get invited to give a talk now. It's pretty much no and less yes. Um, I'm not trying to build a career. There's uh, a certain amount of work and travel and uh, updating the slides or whatever the hell it may be. And there's other things I want to put my time on. But uh, people who don't make that shift, you'll find them get into a kind of a crazy point, maybe you've been there, uh, of trying to move ahead on every opportunity that presents itself. And they're all good, but uh, in combination, they are absolutely lethal to uh, try to take them on more than the right number at the same time. So, um, and then, you know, you're no and less yes, the criteria uh, for saying yes Change at the beginning; they're you know, pretty relaxed, and then they get more and more constrained as time goes by. So, so you mentioned a word that I want to grab onto, which is is finite. And mm-hmm. there is a book that has, in the last two years, it's very, it's very odd. Maybe it's selective attention, kind of like when you buy, say, a new jacket or a new car and suddenly it seems like everyone is wearing the same jacket or driving the same car. Uh, Chances are it hasn't happened overnight. You just have more attention towards it. But there's a book, there's a book that originally came to my attention through Jane McGonigal, who's brilliant and amazing. And Uh it's, and uh, this was about two years ago and it has increasingly been sort of entering my life from different directions, and that is uh, James P. Carse's Finite and Infinite Games. Oh, good. So I w- could you please tell people about this book and how it has affected your thinking? Um, or, or just the principle or the, the distinction between a finite and an infinite game? I got really interested in games um, back in the early 70s and, uh, in fact, organized a thing called the New Games Tournament. And the idea I had there was that actually began with uh, my mentor at the time, a psychologist, biologist, anthropologist (laughs) named Gregory Bateson. And uh, for some reason we were talking about theory of games and uh, the way it was being played out and in terms of the um, nuclear standoff of the Cold War. He said, theory of games is, is brilliant. He actually knew John von Neumann, who came up with uh, it. And he said, the problem with the theory of games is it doesn't have uh, a theory about how you change the, the rules of the game. And I thought that was a profound thing to say and a profound thing to ponder and maybe act on. And then I... I got myself noticing the way I as a kid played games and the way kids in general play games if they're not carted off to Little League and soccer practice and all that stuff, um, is that when they play games, they're changing the rules all the time. And so, uh, you know, stickball is sort of a, a version of baseball that depends entirely on how many people you've got. Uh, in the street and the nature of the street and what you're going to be able to use as first base and stuff like that. And um, kids are more easily bored than anybody, and so they'll be playing a game and it's going along, and uh, it gets kind of uh, boring. And so somebody says, you know, what if we play volleyball or instead of uh, the way you usually play it, we play it where uh, let's see how long we can go. Usually the usual rules, only the deal is see how long we can go before the ball hits the ground. And it turns from a competitive into a collaborative game. 
So I set up the New Games Tournament as a public place where a bunch of strange games would be uh, provided. I provided a six-foot-high earth ball that people invented various games around, this big push ball that crowds of people can uh, interact with. Uh, we had a uh, we got a huge ship's hawser and it had tug of war that went across kind of a canyon <laughs> uh, where it was uh, a 300 foot ship's hawser and a couple hundred feet people on each side. Uh, and it was a Le Mans start, so I had a starter pistol and you had to both sides had to stand off 10 feet away from the rope and fire the pistol. They both run to the rope and start pulling. And of course, they're pulling across the canyon, so the the team that's starting to lose are finding themselves dangling over this. That was really just an arroyo, but uh, they're dangling in space. And then st- bystanders would feel sorry for them and then join the team that was about to lose and uh, help pull the other direction. And those guys would start to lose, and bystanders would help them and go back and forth. Um, this kind of emergent property of uh, kind of freely uh, shaping games uh, really, really interested me. So this is, and we had a number of of such things there. I invented a few games. Some of them were semi-violent. And um, what would be an example of a semi-violent sp- game? Uh, one that was called Slaughter. Uh, I developed this for the War Resisters League. This during the resistance to the Vietnam War, and the War Resisters League knew that I was doing public events, and they asked me, like the Troops Festival, they asked me to would I do a public event for them. So uh, here's an ex-military guy who's being asked to these people who want nothing to do with the military to. <laughs> advise them on uh, what kind of event to have. And I said, well, you guys need a war uh, in, in the worst way. And, but it can be war in your terms. And so we uh, sort of came up with a, a series of uh, public events that we did at various campuses in the Bay Area that had, among other things, uh, some kind of war-like games. The one I invented was called Slaughter. It's what I knew from hanging out with American Indians and others is that... Um, Really, physical games that involve both sexes um, is is really good for young people because you get to do a lot of kind of. Um, God, we're not allowed to say grab ass now, but it it's physical, sweaty interaction that is not uh, explicitly sexual, but everything is sexual at that age, and so it's like dancing only competitively. And uh, in a little more free form. So the game I invented for these uh, were sisters who I thought were not in their bodies sufficiently, or probably getting late enough uh, <laughs> that uh, this game would uh, involve very, very physical interaction. And what we did was we get a pretty large wrestling mat, maybe 20 feet by 20 feet, and uh, it was played on your knees because one of the things I realized is that People standing up can take uh, their interactions are too violent and falling down hurts and so on. Um, and the deal was that uh, there's two teams, it be shirts or non-shirts or socks or non-socks or whatever, and they're on their knees and there's a starter gun and they go at each other and um, the deal is to, you can kill uh, the other players by wrestling them off the edge of the mat and uh, had to slaughter. And you know, immediately people start coming up with all sorts of strategies of teaming up and or, you know, trying to stay out of the fray and lasting longer and you know, the various things you can imagine people doing. And the deal is um, once any part of your body goes over the edge of the mat, you're dead and you turn into a referee. And so the people who have been killed are immediately out there saying, ah, you're out, down, tap, tap, you got to leave. And I threw in some other complications of medicine balls that had to be put in baskets and things like that. So it had the advantage of being intensely physical because people really are having to grab and wrestle each other and and move them from you know, to the edge of the mat and simultaneously deal with defending a basket and moving their ball into the other team's basket. Where is it now? And uh, there was an overwhelm. Uh, an intensity and an overwhelm that is ideal because you get out of your body of that much intensity and that many things to think about at once. Um, so that was slaughter. 
And what was the... Uh, did you observe any particular effect on the group from playing this game? Aside from... They loved it. They loved they, it. They fucking loved it. I mean, you know, <laughs> of course these war resistors were dying to have uh, physical combat. <laughs> and, uh, and in a way that clearly was you know, not killing anybody. It's not even hurting anybody. We had T-shirts that said, play hard, play fair, nobody hurt. And um, in, in a way, that, that was uh, the better thing than war, is kind of a competitive situation where you play hard, play, far, play hard, play fair, nobody hurt. So um, it worked out well, and all of this is leading up to why a book called Finite and Infinite Games um, is, I think, of fundamental interest, is... Gamification, thinking things in game terms, designing things in game terms, is one of the profound things that civilization has done for a very long time. And um, it, it's a, a, a way of, of organizing physical and mental behavior, often in combination, that is uh, just wonderful. And uh, there, you know, along with the James P. Kars book, uh, the other book is Homo Ludens by uh, by uh, Heusinger. And Homo Ludens basically says, man the player, uh, you know, games is, is what we do. Well, here Karst takes apart the games that are win-lose, like elections, to the games that are uh, that go on forever, which is democracy. And... Um, you need them both. <laughs> and uh, within any election, you're, everybody's got to go by the rules that they've agreed to. But within democracy, uh, you're always looking for, okay, we got a problem with the rules or we're bored with the rules. Uh, what's an improvement that we can make? And the infinite game is the infinite improvement of the games we play. Um, and that's civilization story. Uh, right now in democracy, we're you know thinking about should we change the rule about electoral college versus uh, popular vote, and uh, we're talking about changing the rules of uh, how to prevent gerrymandering from being uh, such a distorter of the electoral process, and so on. I think the the more people are comfortable with the idea of. Uh, constantly improving the games we play and the, the techniques of doing that and the freedom to do that in the sense that it goes on indefinitely, uh, the better off we are. And uh, as, as Carson might say, to playing playing with the rules, not just within the rules. And um, Yeah. The... But you've got to do both because no, right. you and, can't and just that's one of the points he makes is, system. you know, within a game there's a boundary, there's going to be rules, players of the, of the game need to agree on the rules. And you see kids do this all the time. They, you know, they play a game, sort of not so interesting, somebody says, well, let's do it uh, so-and-so way. Well, nah, nah, that's not, and then there's an argument. And all the argument, oh, okay, we'll try it that way. And uh, and if if it works and they like it, then they'll keep it. Um and on it goes. So it, there's there's the game, and then there's the argument, and that combination is part of the story. <laughs> now, is the is the contrast that you've I believe you've made before between goals and pathways related to the all of this, or is it maybe a separate topic that I'd still nonetheless love to hear you expand on a bit. In this, uh, yeah, it, whether it's related to any of your projects, right, the whole Earth catalog or anything else, I've I've read that you know goals are not that interesting to you, but pathways are, and I, I would be as someone who has traditionally been very goal focused, but has in recent years changed my thinking about uh, how I select projects to be uh -huh. maybe less explicitly, singularly goal-focused. Uh, I would love to hear your distinction between the two, goals and pathways. Uh, this comes down to a lot of the 
um, you know, career uh, theories that one, one hears out there. Um, follow your passion. Uh, figure out what you want to do in life. Major in it. <laughs> Get a graduate degree in it and then go do it. Um, that I think really works for people who, who have a clear idea that they want to be an X. But I kind of buy that that's only for some people. A lot of us have no idea what we want to be, or it turns out the early... I, I wanted to be a firefighter. Um, I fought a forest fire briefly in Michigan when I was young, and uh, I was going to go to uh, the University of Idaho, Idaho in Moscow, and go ahead and get a Ph.D. in firefighting. Unfortunately, I had a teacher in prep school who said, you know, uh, you could go to someplace else like Stanford for your undergraduate degree, and then if you want to get a Ph.D. in firefighting, go to Idaho. That hadn't really occurred to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, he saved me from uh, probably a pretty limited fate of of going to the University of Idaho versus Stanford in that case, which I had the option of both. Um, it's, I got to prep school and then to college and realized that nearly everybody there was smarter and more capable than me. And um, a lot of them knew exactly what they planning to do. There were going to be lawyers and biologists and physicists and whatnot. And I adopted my older brother who had gone to Stanford. Mike uh, had gone there eight years before me and um, he knew some of the best teachers there because he stumbled into them or heard about them. And he said the way to get the best out of college is to find out who the really good teachers are and then get a major that limits you the minimum and then go to all the good teachers. So I did that. And one of the things that got for me was a sort of a wider range of uh, many expertises than I would have gotten otherwise. And then um, and then when I got out of Stanford, I started taking courses at the San Francisco Art Institute and uh, uh, San Francisco State College in various skills that I wanted to get in design and in uh, photography among other things. And so by the time I was 22, I probably had eight different ways I could have made a living with skills that I had acquired from being a logger, choker setter, to being a, an infantry officer, to being a field biologist, to being a commercial photographer and various other things. Um, most of those things I did not do. In fact, the things that I had trained to do, uh, the only one that really played out was uh, you know, six or eight years later when I started the Whole Earth Catalog, I had taken some courses in uh, writing and in magazine design, actually, uh, way the hell back at Stanford. And so when I wanted to start what was a magazine, Whole Earth Catalog, I ignored the advice I'd been told, which it takes a million dollars to start a magazine. I started it with ten or twenty thousand um, dollars, but I had the skills. So, you know, the general rule there is just keep on acquiring skills, and uh, they, the way they add up, uh, lets you do things that turn up that you discover you really want to do that you did not know that before, but now you can do it. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, that is when I mentioned that I had changed how I was approaching choosing projects. Uh, it's actually very similar uh, in the sense that uh, Scott Adams, creator of Dilbert, uh, refers, uh -huh. refers to, I suppose in place of pathways, he would talk about systems thinking, which is in some ways a little confusing, but effectively choosing projects based on the skills and relationships that you develop so that even if said project fails over time, you are accumulating skills and relationships so that when, like you said, an opportunity presents itself that you couldn't possibly have foreseen and pegged as a goal, as an objective or a goal, say three years before uh -huh. you are sort of ripe to take advantage of. Uh, 
So I, yep. I, I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's it. I'm, yeah. I'm agreeing with you. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, we could talk for hours, but I want to be respectful of your time and, and wrap up shortly. The, so you just agreed with me and that's actually a perfect segue because, uh, you, you agree and then disagree and seem very flexible in changing your viewpoints and changing your mind. And you do this publicly. Uh, Mm -hmm. This is uncommon in a lot of worlds. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I wish Uh, it were common, especially in politics. Yeah, so how, how did you... How did you develop this, or what is the self-talk that allows you to do that uh, so readily? Um, I was trained as a scientist, as a biologist at Stanford. That was a, a relatively uh, low requirement major when I was there. Is one of the reasons I took it. But I also knew I was interested in biology quite seriously. And um, the thing about it, training is a as a scientist, is um, science is the only news. It is going to keep changing, and and uh, you will be taught uh, something is uh, probably the case, and then you learn often within a year or so. Well, actually, <laughs> we were wrong about that, and uh, the people who were strong proponents of that. Uh, have been exposed to the results of the people who thought they were probably wrong, and it turns out they were wrong. And uh, whether or not they've admitted it, everybody else knows it, and so let's move on. And so that moving on uh, as a result of results, as a result of trying stuff, experiments, or observation, or whatever, with various hypotheses, um, you start to get used to the idea that all your opinions are hypotheses, and uh, some of them play out and some don't. But the, as you say, that's not a, a standard mode of public discourse. So um, I think it's helpful for when somebody changes their mind about something to um, spread the word that uh, you know, they're, they're pleased now. <laughs> now uh, I realize lots of times somebody's going to go from one uh, crazy belief to another. And uh, in the 60s and 70s, we saw people buy into a lot of uh, mystical frameworks and gurus and whatnot, and they would move from one to the other. But then I think you, you can go up a level and, and suggest, well, if you're moving from guru A to guru B and then to guru C, does that suggest that maybe for you, gurus are a waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> and so you know, there's various levels of being wrong and acknowledging it and deciding what to do about that. Um, in some cases, you know, doubling down is the right thing to do because uh, you really think there is something there even though uh, it, it, the, the first round it doesn't look like it's for sure there. So you double down a few times and um, and maybe if you get punished enough for that, you'll decide that doubling down is no longer the right thing to do for you. Um, but I think with politicians, I would love every politician to have pretty good answers to the question of, uh, sir or ma'am, uh, in the course of your public service, and thank you for doing that, what are some things that you noticed you were wrong about and you had to change your mind about? And uh, tell us about that. And if they say, as I've always said, I'm never wrong, uh, you know not to waste your time with them. Yeah. It's got such an important question. How, what is, given the game, now so we're talking about inf- finite and infinite games, and I don't want to take us too far into political land because it, it would be <laughs> a full... No, it another, instantly, uh, date, date, instantly dated right now. Well, Whatever we say politically so, uh, is going to be out of date tomorrow. Right. So I, I want to focus more on the, the, game, the game that politicians have chose to play. Mm-hmm. What is... Now, it, is it possible to be an effective politician while still answering that question... Honestly, I guess there are probably examples of people who have answered that honestly, but then there are people who answer it honestly and get 
labeled a flip flopper or whatever you might call it, and that's used as ammo against them in, say, elections of various types. Uh, so, so is well, I think a shining example of uh, mind changing that we have in California is Governor Jerry Brown. And I was on his personal staff in his first term back when he was the youngest governor. And I've kept a little bit in touch with him now that he's our oldest governor. Um, and I remember, so I would be part of the entourage and we'd go to some public event like Space Day or something like that, which I helped initiate and organize. And, uh, you know, there outside the event would be the usual protesters about one thing or another. And, uh, I would find myself, you know, trying to get Jerry in, and we're almost late, come on, let's keep moving, and then he would see the protesters, and then he would veer off and go over and uh, talk to them. And we're rolling our eyes, but here's how he would talk to the protesters. He'd, uh, he'd go over to you know, whoever it looked like was being a spokesman. Maybe they had the loud hailer or something, and say, uh, uh, glad you're here, what's on your mind? And they would start to say their trip. And he would listen for a bit, and they'd say, I think I got it. Let me see if I got it. And then he would say back to them their stance, often better than they had stated it. And you would see them just melt. Um, because the thing they wanted to have happen was for him to be aware of their position and to understand it. And he just showed that he'd done that. And then they had the further hope that since it was known that Jerry occasionally changed his mind and his policy on things, that not only had he heard their position, he might even adopt it at some point. And so he could always engage and diffuse opposition with the fact that he could be persuaded out of a position that he had publicly taken. This made him a, a, a he was not a good speaker, he was not a charismatic character for the longest time, uh, basically an introvert in public life. And yet, that characteristic, as much as any other, um, he did a lot of good policy. He was very bright and eventually a very capable politician. Um, but that characteristic, I think, opened him up to a, a very successful political career. And I think he came into it partly because he is kind of a contrarian. Uh, he likes to uh, go against the flow. And... Um, and this would be a case where, you know, he was the son of, he grew up in a political family with Pat Brown, his father. And there were things about the way politics were done that he didn't approve of. That was one of them. So he just went against it and won big. Now, for somebody who's thinking of going into politics, uh, which I would encourage anybody to do, Jerry Brown is one good example. The other, to me, most wonderful example is Theodore Roosevelt. And there's a, uh, a three-volume biography of Theodore, Theodore Roosevelt by an author whose name is escaping me that is totally inspiring. This is a, an individual with modest gifts who basically set out on your kind of self-improvement um, project early on. He was kind of a weak kid. Uh, he was born to do money and uh, got himself out of the strictures of that, uh, you know, became a rancher out west and all the rest of it, and kept reinventing himself and helped reinvent America in profound ways that uh, make you want to take on his kind of self-project and also take on public service uh, in the way that he did. So, um, you know, one of the campaigns these days is to get more scientists and engineers going into not just appointed politics, but elective politics. And I'm all for it. I think it's what needs to happen. Is the three book series by Edmund Morris? That's the one. All right. it's, a, it's beautifully written, beautifully researched, and an astounding subject. All right. Uh, that is on my immediate shopping list. If someone listening not planning to go into politics, does not have, let's assume it's someone who has no scientific training, so to speak of, uh, like yours truly. I do not. I'm not a trained scientist. Well, 
I don't know. I mean, I'm not a, a formally trained scientist. In in any case, are there any books that you would recommend that people could use to help train themselves to think more scientifically and therefore be less uh, hell bent on holding on to strong opinions when given new information? I'm just wow, thinking. what a very good question, and yeah. I'm, I wish the hell I had an immediate answer to it. Yeah. Um, I mean, if probably I'm... you know some of the biographies of good scientists. Uh, Edward O. Wilson wrote a, a rather wonderful memoir called Naturalist about his um, becoming one of the the great biologists of his time. And this is a guy who revolutionized the field of biology five or six times personally. So, what was the name again? Uh, it's called Naturalist by Edward O. Wilson. Ed- Edward O. Wilson. Got it. Yeah. And uh, who was one of my uh, inspirations as a biologist. And then I later got to know him. We worked together on a couple of projects. And it was just you know awesome to do that. Um, and this is uh, a guy who's won the Pulitzer Prize twice, so you're, you know, you're yeah. in the hands of a very good writer. Um, writings by Freeman Dyson are excellent on how science actually works. They're mostly collections of essays. Uh, one of his books is called Infinite in All Directions, <laughs> <laughs> which is uh, the right kind of frame to have in relation to the universe. Um and science can get you there, as it did for him. Um, the Feynman, uh, surely you're joking, Mr. Feynman. You know, I was going to bring it other, up. Uh, yeah, those work very well. Cause, such a great book. Uh, this was one of the great science teachers, as well as one of the great scientists. Um, and sort of watching him think uh, is just good across the board. Yeah, there's a fantastic uh, documentary. I want to say it was Nova. So it's an old television program. It's hard to find, but it's called The Joy of Finding Things Out, in, in which Feynman talks about, in many ways, how his father taught him how to think and how to question authority. And it's just fantastic if people can track that down also. But surely you must be joking, or surely you're joking, Mr. Feynman is such a wonderful read. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. So ones like that, um, and it's a good question to keep going. I think, uh, you know, ask it of, of any people with a science background you get on your series here. I will. And last, last uh, maybe second to last question. I just turned 40 recently, which has led me to think a lot about uh, maybe rules I've set for myself or trajectory and many other things just to reassess it's, it wasn't a crisis of any type i feel good about it but i'm trying to ponder many different things what do you wish you knew at age 40 or is there any advice that you would give me or a 40 year old <laughs> of course uh, you know their specifics would be helpful but anything you wish you knew or that you would emphasize for me or someone who just turned 40? Um, I think there's still plenty of time is uh, not a thing which comes completely to mind at age 40. There's the, the yeah, I think you may think it's, uh, you know, sort of it's all downhill from here <laughs> or there's only so much time left and uh, some of the things that go with I'm no longer young and things are no longer infinite in all directions. They're starting to be finite in all directions. <laughs> um, but uh, there's plenty of time. And, and to some extent, time compresses as your age increases. I remember when my mother was in her 80s, I said, what's time like for you? And she said, years are like fence posts, uh, just whipping, whipping by. And uh, I certainly feel that at 78. I feel like I'm spending all my time clipping my fingernails and going to get another goddamn haircut. <laughs> uh, and yet, the thing which expands as time goes by, which is um, 
you don't have to rederive a lot of stuff uh, from first principles. You've already got a number of things squared away. You've got a number of friends you can count on. You've got a number of skills that you can deploy. Uh, and so when you do take on something new, uh, it's not like when you were 22 where you have to sort of create the whole world to do it in. You've got a lot of skills. And so in a way, time is compressed for you in terms of your abilities. And uh, that will continue as long as your brain functions. Um, and then, then that dials down, and then you're uh, presumably got to deal with how you're going to deal with uh, your sensations are still pretty intense and uh, get value from them. Do you have any last recommendations, uh, thoughts, or questions that you'd like to leave with the people listening to this, mm. or, or any re, or any request or ask of the people listening to this? I keep running into versions of something we came across a couple of times in this discussion, which is uh, people worrying about unintended consequences of uh, often of new technologies or of uh, you know some new regime or practice, whatever the hell it may be. And um, and then often it'll be in the mode of uh, don't even expect or that area because unintended consequences will occur. And I think the mode should be, well, of course unintended consequences will occur. And uh, maybe it's even worse, and this is in your version of defining your fears, um, think about what the consequences that you're worried about are. And uh, meanwhile, let's watch while the thing goes ahead and tries, or go ahead and try it yourself, and watch for those uh, things that you're worried about. And also watch for surprises. Uh, lots of unintended consequences are surprising. And then you watch for uh, ones that are surprisingly good as well as ones that are surprisingly bad. As near as I can tell, in most cases, you got a kind of an even split uh, with the expectation that the ones that are surprisingly good you can not only uh, stop worrying about you know, the, the things you were worried about associated with that, uh, you can build on them. And also the ones that are surprisingly bad, uh, that may indicate, well, okay, that whole pathway is uh, not so good after all, shut it down. Or are there workarounds? And uh, basically it's trying to flip from being fearful about unintended consequences to being welcoming about situations that might have unintended consequences. I love that, and it it makes me think of on top of that, uh, recognizing that with everything you do in almost every moment, there are unintended consequences. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, weird shit happens uh, at, at all times, and that uh, it it draws for me a parallel with, and I may be misattributing this, but I, I believe at one point I read about Andy Grove, and in his. Uh, management approach uh, would recognize that whenever you created an incentive, you would simultaneously create a perverse incentive or an incentive to do things that were undesirable, right? So perhaps you're, uh, I'm making this up, but you have, you create a commission structure for people to, uh, who bring in a certain dollar amount of advertising revenue, but in a, the, and you could ask yourself in advance, what would the, what might the, uh, sort of perverse incentive there be, and it would be to get someone to spend a lot of money up front, which could lead to advertiser disappointment because it's front loaded and then a high churn rate. And so, how can you, when you have a metric for what you desire, how could you, what metric could you look for or create to track what you don't desire? And it could be, say, a high churn rate, right? So, if you're thinking of assumption number one, there are always going to be unintended consequences to any. Uh, material action. So how can you, how can you measure them? How can you track them? Uh, I think it's so important. Uh, we, we just mentioned, uh, well, Stuart, it is such a joy and such an honor to ha have a chance to spend more time with you. 
uh, on the phone like this and in conversation. It's it's so much fun for me. And uh, is there any particular place that uh, people can check out that you'd like them to check out uh, online or places where they could say hello to you on social media? Okay, I'm on Twitter, um, Stuart Brand, and um, the Long Now Foundation is, uh, is a website, uh, longnow.org, that has all sorts of things. And we have a bar in San Francisco. I think there's relatively few nonprofits that have a bar, but we do. <laughs> at Fort Mason, that people are welcome at, and all sorts of things are there. That's, uh, then, the, uh, the, that's the interval? Yeah, that's the interval. Um, and that was, uh, I think, uh, the interval.org. And then reviverestore.org is uh, the place where the genetic rescue projects I'm talking about uh, are going on. We started that within Long Now as a project, and now it's gone independent. And it's its own 501c3 charging ahead with saving various species and various ecosystems genetically. Well, Stuart Brand, I... Uh... Thank you so much. I really appreciate all the all the time. Um, I've I've learned a lot. I've taken many many notes, as I hope other people have. Uh, so, I just want to express my gratitude for you taking the time. Well, you make it fun for your interviewees. So keep up the good work. <laughs> all right, and uh, to everybody listening, as always, and uh, this is going to be one hell of a set of show notes. Uh, you can find links to everything that we've talked about in the show notes at tim.blog forward slash podcast for this episode and every other episode. And until next time, and as always, thank you for listening. Hey guys, this is Tim again. Just a few more things before you take off. Number one, this is Five Bullet Friday. Do you want to get a short email from me? Would you enjoy getting a short email from me every Friday that provides a little morsel of fun before the weekend? And Five Bullet Friday is a very short email where I share the coolest things I've found or that I've been pondering over the week. That could include favorite new albums that I've discovered. It could include gizmos and gadgets and all sorts of weird shit that I've somehow dug up in the uh, the world of the esoteric as I do. It could include favorite articles that I've read and that I've shared with my close friends, for instance. And it's very short. It's just a little tiny bite of goodness before you head off for the weekend. So if you want to receive that, check it out. Just go to fourhourworkweek.com. That's fourhourworkweek.com all spelled out and just drop in your email and you will get the very next one. And if you sign up, I hope you enjoy it. This episode is brought to you by Four Sigmatic, founded by the genius Finns who lit the internet on fire. And uh, you may have heard of their mushroom coffee, which features chaga and lion's mane, which has taken Silicon Valley by storm. I use it pretty much every day, either that or the chaga, which is decaf, there's a separate version. And I use both of these primarily for focus and productivity. They just get you going, light you up like a Christmas tree. So you should definitely check it out. People are always asking me what I use for cognitive enhancement. And for right now, this is the answer. I try to force this on all of my house guests. It is a hell of a thing. If I have employees or people come over who are working on projects with me, I always try to feed it to them because I'm going to get the limitless effect and get a lot more out of them. The first time I mentioned this product and Four Sigmatic on the podcast, their products sold out in less than a week. So you may want to check them out soon if you're listening to this. And the coffee tastes like coffee. It uh, takes just seconds to prepare with hot water and oddly enough only includes 40 milligrams of caffeine. So it has less than half of what you'd get in a regular cup of coffee. I don't get any jitters, acid reflux, or any stomach burn, any of that. It's very unusual and very, very cool. So if you don't like caffeine, they also offer very strong but caffeine-free mushroom elixirs, which I will sometimes have in the evening. I find chaga specifically to be very, very grounding and earthy. So that is another option. And I have a cupboard full of their products uh, at the moment, which is right around the corner of my kitchen. You can try something. You can try a sample pack, which is great also. Right now, by going to Four Sigmatic dot com forward slash Tim. That's four sigmatic F O U R S I G M A T I C 
Shopify.com forward slash Tim and use the code Tim, T-I-M, to get 20% off of your first order. And they're not that expensive anyway. If you are in the experimental mindset, I do not think you'll be disappointed. So try them out. This episode is brought to you by Peloton. And I'd heard about Peloton over and over again, but I ended up getting a Peloton bike in the whole system after I saw my buddy Kevin Rose. I've known him forever, some of you know, and he showed up at my gate at my house a while back and he looked fantastic. And uh, I asked him, I said, dude, you look great. What the hell have you been up to? Because he's always doing a weird diet or another, but it only lasts like a week or two. So he always regresses to the mean after like 75 beers. And he said, I've been doing Peloton five days a week. Now that caught my attention because Kevin does nothing five days a week. And you know I love you, Kevin. But it really piqued my curiosity. Ended up getting a system and it's become an integral part of my week. I love it and I really didn't expect to love it at all because I find cycling really boring usually. But Peloton is an indoor cycling bike that brings live studio classes right into your home. You don't have to worry about fitting classes into your schedule or making it to a studio with some type of commute, etc. New classes are added every day, and this includes options led by elite New York City instructors in your own living room. You can even live stream studio classes taught by the world's best instructors or find your own favorite class on demand. And in fact, Kevin and I rarely do live classes, and you can compete with your friends, which is also fun. Kevin, I'm coming after you. But we usually just use classes on demand. I really like Matt Wilpers and his high intensity training sessions that are shorter, like 20 minutes. And I think Kevin's favorite is Alex, and everyone seems to have their favorite instructor, or you can select by music, duration, and so on. Each Peloton bike includes a 22 inch HD touchscreen, performance tracking metrics. I think that, along with the real time leaderboard, are the main reasons that this caught my attention when cycling never had caught my attention before. It's really pretty stunning what they've done with the user interface to keep your attention. The belt drive is quiet and it's smaller than you would expect. So it can fit in a living room or an office. I actually have it in a large closet, believe it or not, and it fits with no problem. So Peloton is offering all of you guys, listeners of the Tim Ferriss Show, a special offer, and it is actually special. Visit One Peloton, that's O N E P E L O T O N, OnePeloton.com, and enter the code TIM, all caps T I M, at checkout to receive $100 off accessories with your Peloton bike purchase. Now you might say, meh, accessories? Wait, I don't need fancy towels or whatever other supplemental bits and pieces. No, the shoes you need. You need the clip-in shoes, and those are in the accessory category. So this $100 off is a very legit $100 off. So if you wanna get in your workouts, if you want a convenient and really entertaining way to do high-intensity interval training or anything else, or you just want to get a fantastic gift for someone, check out Peloton onepeloton.com and enter the code TIM. Again, that's O-N-E-P-E-L-O-T-O-N.com and enter the code TIM at checkout to receive $100 off any accessories, including the shoes that you will want to get. Check it out, onepeloton.com, code TIM. 